everybody, Chris Schmidt with Rocket Lasso with the first official big tutorial. I'm super excited because we've got Aaron Covret hanging out. Man, what's Hello. going on? I'm hey, so hey, hey, it's going really well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so excited you're going to be here on the first tutorial. Your work is incredible. But even if you don't know his name, you've probably seen his work. The main one that jumps to mind is you are the one who created and posted the Harvest Render, which yeah, was... I'm the I'm the pumpkin guy. <laughs> yeah, the pumpkin guy. Yeah, the gourds and everything. But it's like this beautiful, like old timey painting. Like it's fabric, and it's just such a beautiful still life. So everybody knows that one because it's like, what? That's CG. That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was it was a really exciting personal project that I worked on last year, and I really got to dive in and try out a lot of new techniques and new processes. Uh, some of which made it into my NAB presentation in Vegas this year. Uh, which I think is partially why I'm here. So that's very exciting. That is 100% why you're here because I watched your presentation <laughs> and became obsessed with some of this photogrammetry stuff. And then you and I started chatting back and forth and then getting into a lot of details. Like, dude, we've got to record this. We got to share it. It's such a, such a great kind of workflow and technique. Yeah. And it's just so, there's something incredibly satisfying about holding a physical object and then putting it in the computer and then making a thousand clones of it. Like it's so much fun. Yes, exactly. Especially like someone like me who I really haven't dived into like ZBrush yet. So uh, being able to like quickly translate that into into like an actual 3D object is really cool. So having said all that, why don't we get into what we're officially doing here? So Aaron, what is photogrammetry? Photogrammetry is a really, really cool process where we can actually take a bunch of photos, a huge sequence of images of our actual physical objects, such as in this case, a little garden gnome. And what we can do with that is we can actually take, again, about like 90 to 100 image sequences and we can feed that into an image processing tool, in this case, such as a tool called Meshroom that we'll be using today. And what that'll essentially do is complete a series of tasks to reconstruct like a, uh, a 3D point cloud of that asset. And from there, we can mesh that and actually have a 3D object of our scan. That, yeah, exactly. Now we're going to get into the specifics of some of the software in a second, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what makes for a good candidate for this type of workflow. Right. Because first of all, there's a lot of objects that this isn't the right way to go about doing it. If, if you're going to model something very kind of mechanical, you know, like an example, if, if I just hold up this cup, like this cup is really straightforward. That's a couple of circle splines and a loft. It's really quick to make. It'd be silly to try and do photogrammetry on something like that. So you just held up the gnome which is what was the primary inspiration for this. Uh, I'm the one who actually went and did the photo sequence here. So I had to go and buy a different gnome. Uh, <laughs> so I went and bought this cute little guy. Now, one of the problems is, is that the only gnome I could find was significantly smaller than yours, which introduced some extra challenges here. And I was a little hesitant about that, but it was like, you know what? It's almost like the worse the scenario is that we're dealing with, then the more it should be helpful for people for, for ways to get around that. But that, that's what we're actually using. But I want to do a couple quick, quick examples of things that would be not such a good candidate. Uh, not such a good candidate would be very geometric shapes, the very mechanical. Like if you have like a computer circuit board, like you wouldn't do that because it's going to be rough and organic and blobby. Um, and then another bad example would be something very shiny, clear glass. This will not work at all. First of all, it's transparent. The camera's going to see right through it. It's not going to have any idea what to do with it. So that's a dead end right there. And then another bad example would be something very shiny. So another example here, I just got this nice copper cup, which is holding all of my pens. So I love this cup and I love how shiny it is, but that almost makes it instantly invalid. And then even along those lines, you can see if we were to look inside the cup, it's like, oh, well, you can scan all the pens and pencils and everything. And it's like, well, once again, those are very geometric and it's gonna be really hard. The camera can't get inside to get the detail of the individual objects. So you really want something that's maybe a little bit bigger, very flat um, or matte rather, not flat, but a matte type of color, right? Yeah, and there are, you know, if you are faced with like maybe a client is delivering something that is like a specular or or very reflective surface, the, you know, one of the workarounds potentially if you're willing to sort of tamper with that asset a little bit is to actually buy like matte spray paint and you can actually spray these assets to get a little bit uh, more friendly of a surface to be scanning. Uh, of course, then you'd be, you know, you'd be tampering with the physical objects. So you kind of have to, it's circumstantial if you can do that or not. But yeah, uh, but yeah that is a, that is a factor. And if you, if you want to go and destroy that said object, although <laughs> exactly, we'll get into some more details here because I found some extra limitations, even with this little gnome and we'll get into that. 
But some examples of objects that totally do work is the first object I scanned in was a potato. The potato is, it's nice and round. It's very matte. There's a lot of variation in texture. Now, it wouldn't be terribly hard to model this, but this texture is like really great. Um, so this turned out to be a really good candidate for that. I've also got this dog bone, which I figured could <laughs> go to the dog after being scanned. And so very flat, matte things, I think, are the best example here. Exactly. Well, that, that harkens back to even like what I did with like that harvest piece, for example, like in that asset uh, or in that, I'm sorry, in that piece, a lot of the assets that I'm scanning are very organic uh, shapes that tend to be a little bit more flexible when you're actually scanning a blobby, you know, 3D model. And so like the pumpkins, the gourds, stuff like that. Well, there's so much like nature built in. There's imperfections and it's a little lighter on this end, a little darker on this end, just variations you wouldn't necessarily think about when you're just creating an object from scratch. Um, but then that brings us to our actual object we went with, which is this gnome. And I actually found when I was doing a bunch of tests on him, I did seven individual photo shoots with him and scans until I got one that I thought we could work with. And one challenge I was having is that it was, there's a lot of flat areas of color. So this entire hat was like this very kind of uh, scarlet color that wasn't it, it couldn't detect the shape very well, I think, because it was a very even color. So that actually makes me wonder if you were to spray paint something like a matte gray, it might lose its definition and it might have a lot more trouble figuring out the form. So actually what I ended up doing was slicing a whole bunch of pieces of blue like painter's tape really thin and essentially almost outlining almost some polygons on him so it would define the form. And it actually did a really good job of popping it out. And I wonder if this had a little bit more variation in the color, if the hat had more of a, you know, if it, if it went from a darker color to a lighter color, maybe it would give more definition to it. These are right. some of the interesting limitations that uh, come along with this. Let's take a little bit of time and talk about the actual taking of the photos and what works and what doesn't and kind of little things that we found that were helpful and things that did not work at all. So what was your original process for starting this? Yeah, you know, it's it's been really interesting because uh, I'm coming very much from the viewpoint of really not having that much experience with uh, photography, definitely not with photogrammetry or anything like that. And so the approach that I've had is very much in the mindset of a beginner and trying to be as accessible as possible. And so really what I mean by that is, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm sure I'm not lighting things properly. I'm not I'm just taking photos with my phone, actually. I'm not even using like a DSLR or anything. Um, but what I've found through that process is that even by, you know, having a very, um, beginner sort of mindset, I am still actually able to achieve a really nice level of fidelity in the overall results that I can pull from Meshroom. Yeah. And like I said, we, I got inspired by the way you were doing it. And then I kind of dove in really deep and I started becoming right. kind of obsessed with understanding <laughs> what works, what doesn't. So when I did my potato scans, I probably... I probably did a, a series of photo shoots with the potato, trying all these different circumstances. And like I did, I did this entire part of the process where I built this cage so I could suspend things up in the air and then hold it in front of a green screen so I could go around it. And every time I tried to get fancier and fancier, it, the results were worse and worse and worse. And ultimately what turned out to work well is like get some decently even lighting, the best you can get, like a little bit of daylight bouncing around the room is great. No harsh shadows if you can avoid it. And cap like you would think you'd want to put this on a green screen or something to, so it can capture it. But the software actually works way better if it can see the environment around it because it makes it so that it can find where the camera is supposed to be. If you just have your little gnome sitting in the middle, it doesn't know where to put the camera. But if in the background it can see a chair and the wall and the window, it's like, oh, the window's over there. I know where to put the camera. And so that became a really, really important detail. Um, something, right. uh, oh, go ahead. No, so um, so much of this is about spatial awareness uh, because it's using all of that data to reconstruct the, the the mesh. So as much context, I think, as you can establish in what you're recording, um, ultimately feeding that into Meshroom, it'll have more to sort of chew on, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Something, uh, another technique that I started doing as I learned was, you know, kind of doing a whole photo shoot really close with, let's say, the gnome going, taking picture uh, like around and around and around and around and then going up a little bit and going around and around and around. You do that. But something else that was incredibly helpful was taking a few steps away and just taking a context photo and then maybe moving around, uh, you know, moving 45 degrees to the other side and taking another context photo and even taking one where I step way back. And it's like, 
what ends up happening, especially in Meshroom, is it tries to place all the cameras. And if one camera, if it doesn't know where it is in relationship to the other ones, it just won't use it. But these context photos will actually make it so that photos that previously didn't work will suddenly be like, oh, I know where I am now. And it has another photo to work from. Exactly. One other little thing I like doing is I, I was trying all these different rigs to, to prop it up, like I said. But then one that actually ended up being pretty useful was I have this thing. And it's just like a giant roll of tape that I use for laser cutting, but in a big cardboard tube. And I did this so I could like take the potato and place it up on top. And it was a lot easier for me to go on a lower angle and then shoot up at the underside and capture more of the information. And honestly, it's just a little bit easier on your back when it's a little bit higher up in the air. So that was another additional detail that I found to be pretty helpful. Okay, a couple thoughts about taking the actual photos of your object. First of all, both Aaron and I were both using iPhones. I actually tried using my Sony 6000 to take some photos and I actually got worse results than I got just from a phone. So that doesn't really seem to be a limiting factor here. Now, when you actually go to take your photos, especially here on the iPhone, I went and I held down somewhere on the screen to get the focal point, And that just makes it so you have the same focus and lighting as I do one pass around. The important thing that I was doing is every like 15 degrees, I would stop and take another photo, another photo, Photo, another photo and walk all the way around the entire object. So I travel all 360 degrees around on a single level. And then once that single level was done, I would raise the phone up maybe 45 degrees and go around again at an additional height. And then I'd go really low and take a bunch of photos at the lower angle. And that way you've got a lot of coverage. And you can see here kind of the final layout of one of Aaron's walkthroughs on one of the gourds. Now, after you've taken all your photos, go ahead. If you're on Windows, we're going to pop it open. I just search for photos. It pops open the photo app. It's going to load it right up. Go ahead and I click import. It's going to yell at me that the phone hasn't given permission yet. So I'm going to click iPhone. It's going to say it doesn't work. On your phone, you want to say go ahead and allow access so that Windows can go and download all these. So go ahead and click allow. Pop back in here. Try again. And then it's going to find it. Find your iPhone or whatever phone you're using. Go ahead. Let it find the photos. And I'm going to deselect all of them and then go and make a folder to go find them in particular. So here I'm going to pop it open. Just go to a particular folder. Make a location. Just dump them all in there. Not super important where you put those. And let's go ahead and say done. And now let's select the photos. I'm going to click on one, hold down shift, scroll all the way down to the final location of all the photos. There's like 170 of them here. I went crazy on this. Hold down shift. It'll take a second to select all of them. Go ahead and hit import. And then boom, it's going to pop them all into the computer. You can go ahead and right click on any one of your photos here and then say open up in the Explorer. And then it's going to pop open the window for you. And now you can find it directly in here. So. Let's get into the actual software here. Now we're going to be using Meshroom and Meshroom of course is free, but it only works for PC and I think Linux, but it doesn't work on the Mac. Now Meshroom is just one particular piece of photogrammetry software. I'm gonna go ahead and jump on over here on all3dp.com. They've got this really great article on 16 different photogrammetry softwares and a bunch of these do work on the Mac. Uh, a, bunch, a couple of them are free. Some of them don't cost too much. So if the mesh room part of this process isn't working for you, then there might be other ones to check out. But then the rest of what we're going to talk about will be applicable no matter what piece of software you use. Don't let the fact that we're using Meshroom stop you. Go and check out this article, which I will link below. Then you can continue from there. But specifically, let's go ahead and jump onto this browser and let's just Google Mesh Room. And the very first link is going to be Mesh Room, which is going to link us over to alicevision.github. And I just want to mention that Mesh Room is a free piece of software developed over in Europe, actually by the Imagine Group. And it was kind of like this government-funded European thing. There's a bunch of different groups involved, and they just want to use it to like capture different architectural things and historical things. And they kept on making. They've been working on this for years and years and years. So I just want to do a quick shout out there. Let's go ahead and click on Mesh Room, and immediately we can see we have our download button here. I can click on that. It'll jump over to the screen. Immediately, it wants to save it. So I could go ahead and hit OK, download it. You pop it open, click on the executable, and you will be ready to rock. So having said that, Aaron, uh, why don't you go ahead and take over and explain a little bit about Meshroom? Yeah, so here we go. If we can open this up right away, you'll see this is actually the interface for Meshroom. And it's a really cool node-based workflow. So you see all these nodes down here. And the first thing we can do, let's just bring in those images that Chris just mentioned. And so right away, if I just click on these, you can see this is actually the uh, image sequence that Chris shot of the gnome. And so I can just grab all of these We'll do a batch import. You can see here, there's actually 178. And so Meshroom's gonna process all of these. And there we go. So now I can actually click around and you'll see all of these images are being fed in and processed here. 
And what we can do now, if we dive into these nodes, so essentially what our objective here is that uh, Meshroom is going to process all of these images and it's going to use them to reconstruct a 3D point cloud. And from there, that's sort of getting back to the positional tracking and, and spatial awareness that we had talked about earlier. And we can use that data to actually extract a 3D mesh from the tool. And so what we can actually do here, uh, we don't have to mess with a lot of these. Now, there are a lot of different nodes that we can click on, and there's various settings that we can actually be experimenting with. Uh, I found, I don't know about you, Chris, but I found really you don't have to really uh, mess with much of this here. Yeah, when I was playing around, I, I clicked through. I was looking at all the different settings. I watched different videos and tutorials. And honestly, I did not find a single setting that changing it made any impact in a positive way to it. The defaults were amazing. Exactly. I think this last node is the only thing probably worth mentioning just in, in terms of uh, your output settings. So specifically, since this actually exports out a diffuse map of our texture of the asset, um, you shouldn't necessarily need to change any of this, but if you wanted to, you can define the output size here. So in this case, it defaults to 8K, but you can actually crank this up as high as 16K as well as uh, some other uh, settings. Okay, that said, I think we can actually just go ahead and start the process. And so to do this, let's just click on the start button here. And right away, you'll see Meshroom's actually asking us to define an output for this. So let's just go ahead. I'm going to put this on my desktop even, and we'll just do a GNOME test. And so now with that defined, you'll see Meshroom's actually going to start the process. And it'll actually bring up this terminal that we can view uh, to track our progress. And so what you're seeing happen here is that we essentially just have to uh, progress through each of these nodes. And so we're currently in the feature extraction out of this entire process here. It does tend to be quite time intensive. How long did you find in your test, Chris, that these uh, were taking? I find it's really dependent on the object that you're scanning and how many photos you took. Because the gnome I ended up having was so small, I found I had to take a lot more photos. In some of my original scans of like the potato, I took like 40 photos and it worked completely fine. On this one, I ended up taking, and you, on the one you're processing right now, there's 178 photos, which is pretty intense. That's a lot right. of photos. Uh, something to throw out there is a great feature with Meshroom is once you run the entire scan, once you've done the entire scenario, you can look at the mesh and be like, ooh, it did not capture like like under his arm. It looks terrible. It didn't work at all. And if you still have the your setup going, you still have the lights, you still got everything there, you can turn it back on again. You can go back over with your camera and just take additional photos. Go back and make sure you take a whole bunch of photos there. And then maybe there wasn't quite enough resolution somewhere in the face. So you take some extra photos from along those lines. And you could actually run the entire process over again from scratch. But you can also... Um, as it works through the different nodes, there's the like capture from motion or something that that's the node where it actually places the cameras. I think it'll actually jump to that step and continue from there forward with all the extra new photos that you have. So it, it doesn't save you that much time, but you can actually do kind of a sloppy job, find out where you needed to do more work and then do more work. So this 178 photos is actually the result of seeing not such a great result, going back, taking more photos and adding them to the collection, probably going overboard by a lot. But once again, dependent on the object, the lighting conditions, and probably a lot of other variables as well. Right. Well, and the really cool thing about that as well is that when you take that second pass and you're feeding in new images, that's updating and changing the context of what you're capturing. And so maybe some of those images that are actually sort of not working and reading is sort of like a dead source uh, in the computations because you've given new context with the new images, some of those old ones that weren't working before might actually update and become active again in the, comp uh, in the process. Exactly. And one of my potato scans early on, I took like 40 photos and then like 18 of them, 18 of them did not work. And I went and took more photos. And then when that one processed, it still had the bad 18, but this time 16 of those 18 worked. So new photos actually made old photos work better, which was crazy and practically magic. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is really cool. Another big time variable here, of course, is how many photos you put in. So when I've run quicker ones, this has taken maybe 20 minutes to, to do the entire process. But with these big long ones where I took the biggest one I ever did was 225 photos. That one took like three hours to process. It looked great when it finished, but it took that long to do it. Here we are back over on my machine. I actually already processed this, but it's literally the exact same process of what Aaron was beginning over there, and we've got it complete. So let's take a look. You can see all the images were complete. The entire bar has completed across the top. You can see every single one of the nodes is green across the board. It is 
succeeded all the way across. Now there is a small chance if you don't have enough photos that it might just fail. It might just fail at structure for motion. And if that happens, you have to go take more or better photos and try again. But now that this is completed, you can see that we've got a whole bunch of cameras and we've got a 3D point cloud. So we'll talk about this a little bit, but I just wanna scroll in here and take a look. The navigation's a little wonky because we're so far zoomed in, but you can see every single camera that I took a picture from. And when I scroll out, you can see some of the context cameras I'd been talking about. I moved way far away from it. If I scroll even more, you see there's even more photos trying to give that some context. But if we go and zoom way up, we can see our gnomes looking pretty good. We got our 3D point cloud. And depending on how many photos you took, you can actually see areas that might be missing some detail. I already know for a fact that this one is working pretty well. So I think we're good to continue. Now, once that process completed, all the way, we have the option to click the load model button. So let's go ahead and try and scroll this guy kind of to the front. The angle is pretty arbitrary, so it's gonna be at this very strange angle. But let's go ahead and hit load model. It's gonna take a second, but it's currently loading in an OBJ, the final mesh from what was calculated. So that's gonna pop in here. It's gonna be overlaid on top of everything. But if I go and turn off our structure from motion button right here, the little eyeball, we just see the final model. And you can see that he's looking pretty good. Look at our cute little gnome. He's got his little snail. You see all the pieces of tape sketched on there. I've got this little wooden coaster. So I had something that wasn't reflective that he could sit on. Now, everything else, if I scroll out a little bit, you can see that there's the context here. I put some rubber ducks on my little table here to make sure that it had some features to identify a little bit. I don't know how important those are, but I didn't focus on those areas. So the mesh over there is pretty low. It's pretty terrible. Now you can actually click on the wireframe mode here and you can see exactly how many polygons it made. And the actual gnome is a very dense mesh. We can also click on our solid modes. So you can actually see, kind of see the final here of exactly what we're getting. Now, there are a couple problems here. It's not perfect. And I kind of like the fact that this one's not coming out perfect. This is, where, this is where I was saying, because this gnome was small, there's not that much detail on them. It was having some trouble. So we've got some areas to clean up. And I thought I'd actually be pretty useful for this tutorial. Um, but just for an example, if we were to scroll down here, you can see the rubber duck. There's like almost no detail on it. You can see on the wire mesh that it's looking pretty rough. With that, why don't we go ahead and track down the model and bring this into Cinema 4D. Now, in my folder structure, I've been saving everything into this Meshroom folder. You can see all these different scans I was doing. I did all these different tests until we finally got to this final one that was working pretty well. And something that's kind of uh, neat is Meshroom just dumps all the files it creates into this giant folder. So here's my photos I took. I just kept them trapped in there. But inside of the Meshroom cache, go inside there, and we got all these different folders of everything it was it was creating. So it's all the information. So if we actually go into the very final folder, there's a texturing folder. And inside of the texturing folder, we got this crazy name, but go inside of that. And now you can see we've got our final texture maps and we've got a textured mesh OBJ. So let's go ahead and drag our textured mesh into Cinema 4D. I'm gonna pop open Cinema. Let's get that folder back and I'm just gonna drag it right on over. So the first thing we're gonna see is we have a scale parameter. We got a whole bunch of different settings. Most of them I just completely ignore, but I just know for a fact that the models from Meshroom come in really small. So I have found, and I was just chatting with Aaron about it, that a good scale tends to be about 100. So I'm gonna go scale 100 centimeters instead of one. And that way it's gonna come in a little bit bigger. And the basic idea behind that, let's go ahead and hit okay. The basic idea behind that is you want objects in Cinema 4D to be a, about the size of a cube. It's a good kind of default scale. It's not too big, it's not too small. Um, but there we go, the model has popped open and let's go and zoom around until we find our little gnome guy. and. This there he is. You can see my camera's all wonky because it came in at a really strange angle. But let's go ahead and do some really quick cleanup here. One thing to note is this time it didn't, but oftentimes when I pop open my materials or when I pop open the scene, there's a transparency layer turned on and it makes things really funky. So uh, you can go and open your materials here and turn off transparency, turn off alpha, and then it should look more solid like what I have here. So we've got so many different polygons here. I wanna clean it up so I can work on this a little bit easier. I'm gonna go ahead and go to point mode here and let's go ahead and grab our lasso tool and let's make sure our tolerance selection and visible elements are both turned off because I just wanna make a big old circle that I'm sure I'm capturing everything with our gnome. I can rotate around a little bit. Yes, indeed I did. Hit UI for invert selection, hit delete. And now hopefully we've got something a little bit cleaner that I can work from. 
Now, the actual cleaning up of this mesh, there are so many points. It's going to take a while to clean it up, depending on how we're doing the selection. This is actually an easier object to do it from, but something I bumped into actually last night that made this a lot easier was if I select all my points, it's just a big, giant, uh, foggy cloud of points. But if I turn on SSAO, which I think came in and what was that, R19? Yeah, I believe R19. If I turn that on, it actually shows the shadow on top of the points. So I can see he's on this nice little base here. So it's really easy now for me to go and make a pretty sloppy selection here of all the unnecessary points because the shadow is actually on top of the points that I was selecting, which was pretty cool. So I'm going to do a pretty dang sloppy job selecting all of these points around him. But... Uh, it's going to do a lot of work for getting this ready for the next step. So let's go ahead and do a nice big old selection there. Delete that. And there we go. Now we've got our final little selection of the entire guy. Now, uh, I, I, I really want to flatten this out. Right now it's at the strange angle. Let's go ahead and make a cube. And you can see there's a cube, but that's the orientation that the scene wants to be is like this. So our gnome is at this very strange angle. But at least you see his scale is pretty big. Imagine if he was one one hundredth the size. It'd be really tiny. Um, so I want to zero this out, but before we do that, I want to talk about one other file that Meshroom made for us that is pretty useful. If we go up uh, two folders, so go away from the texturing into the cache, and we go into the structure from motion folder, we can go inside of there, and we will actually find somewhere in the structure is an SFMABC. And that is our Alembic file. It's an Alembic file that's actually captured all of the different cameras. So if I go and I drag that into Cinema 4D, and you see my scale is still set to 100, very important. Let's hit OK, don't change anything else. It has actually brought in our point cloud, but even more importantly than that, it brought in all of our cameras. And not only do we have our cameras, but all the cameras have the exact name of the image that they were driving. So if we were inclined to, I could copy all of these cameras. Let's go ahead and select every single camera. I can hit all G and group them. Now, it actually, these are like Alembic files. Uh, they're Alembic cameras. We can actually select all of them and just hit the letter C, and it's going to make them into just generic cinema ones, so they're not remotely linked anymore. But I can copy this. Let's rename this null cameras, and I can copy that, close the file, don't need that anymore. And because we haven't moved this around yet, if I hit paste, it's exactly matching our object. So something that's cool, we're not going to do this here because it's not needed, but let's go ahead and hide all our cameras. But if I were to unhide one of them, let's say uh, this one, that's actually a really far away camera. So let's not do that one. Scroll down. There's a closer one. I could find this one camera and be like, oh, nice. Here's this camera. I can look at the POV of it. And this is the angle it is. So in theory, I could reproject the material from that camera onto the object and we could maybe extract additional texture information if we wanted to. So I just wanted to throw out there that out there about being able to control your extra cameras. But uh, what might be useful now is those cameras could become a child of the textured mesh. And if we move this around, the cameras will move with it. And we haven't lost that data. Now, I want to leave a lot of the work here to Aaron uh, for cleaning things up. But a hint that you taught me on... The, uh, on your NAB presentation was that right now the texture looks like a mess. Like this is terrifying. Like this didn't come through well at all. But if we go and we pop open one of our, ma our materials and select more of them, or select all of them rather, if we go into our editor and click uh, texture preview size and set that to no scaling, we're going to get the final resolution of the mesh. And you can see the materials look a lot better now. We don't have all those really bad edges showing up. But let's continue flattening our character out. Now, there's a lot of techniques where we might flatten this out, but I'm just going to eyeball this. We're going to need to close the hole on him down there. So I'm going to go ahead and make a disc shape because that's pretty round. And I'm just going to hit Shift S. So it's going to snap to any point. I'm going to click the Move tool and just start moving this. And you can see it's going to be snapping to different points. So if I just snap it to one of the points right at the base, then that's giving us a good initial position to work from. I'm going to turn off snapping. Shift S is the shortcut to turn that off. You can also click the button here. Uh, now I can just hit R for rotate. I'm just going to eyeball it and spin this. There's a couple techniques that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later for getting this to be a little bit more precisely placed. But this is such a simple thing because of the, the this character. He's really... You know, he sits on a flat base, so this is really easy to kind of match here. I'm going to hit T for scale, scale it down, and if we want to be really meticulous, we can go and model this to match that position perfectly. And actually, yeah, I guess we should do it. Okay, so now that that is positioned, I'm going to totally steal this part from Aaron, but let's go <laughs> ahead and 
make this editable and go to polygon mode. I'm going to actually point mode. I'll select all the points and let's go to sculpt and go to brushes and grab the grab. And if I hold down shift as I click my middle mouse button as a button, I can drag to the right and make it a little bit bigger. And now I can start dragging these points in and trying to match our mesh a little bit better. Now I do want to be careful. Um, if I go too far inside, I'll mess it up. So I want to make sure it's a, a little bit bigger than our model but that's looking pretty good there we go just a little bit of that so that's really simple really clean to set that up maybe pull this one out just a hair and that's actually working pretty well i'm pretty happy with that uh it's not quite flat perhaps but i will take it for now and this should be good enough actually from where we initially placed our disc to zero out our character we're going to go ahead and grab our textured mesh make it a child of the disc and i just remembered that i'm still linked to this camera so let's go ahead back in here and unlink from that camera so you can see i'm just in this crazy point of view and let's go back up and grab our disc and hit shift c psr and let's go ahead and click Reset PSR, and that should go ahead and zero out our position, scale, and rotation. So now he is perfectly on the ground. If I were to make a brand new plane object, you can see he's sitting right on top of it. It is working awesome. So let's go ahead and yank our cameras out, and we've got our final little gnome character here. This guy looks like he's pretty much ready to rock to get ready to start our cleanup and retopography, but I want Aaron to take that part over. So I'm going to save this file on Dropbox, and he is going to take over. All right, let's go ahead and open Cinema. And so if I bring this up, you can see this is actually Chris's file that he just sent over. We can go ahead and load this in. And right away, here is that gnome. It's looking great. But I do want to point out a few quick things. So if we actually turn off the textures for a second and we zoom in here, you can see there are a lot of small issues happening on this mesh. And this is coming through just errors in the scans. Maybe there was shadows or highlights sort of interfering with what we were capturing. Look at this over here. This is a really good example. And so what we can discuss today is how to clean all of these issues up as well as have a much better topology that we could be working with. Because you can see here just how dense and sort of messy and triangulated this scan actually is. And so to do this, we're actually going to take advantage of some of R20's new features. Let's go ahead and load in a volume builder. Okay, and so one thing I want to point out really quickly here, this file that Chris sent over, you can see right now the disk is actually set as the parent. Remember, this is what Chris used to help orient the... Uh, gnome mesh and we don't really want this set as the parent right now so I can just go ahead and drag out our gnome mesh. Now let's actually grab this and we'll apply this to this volume builder and so right away you'll see an update. We're actually converting that polygon mesh into a VDB so this is essentially a volumetric representation. In fact I can turn on the wireframe here and you'll see there are no polygons actually in the scene. Now, I do want to point out as well, this isn't a very accurate representation of our gnome, and that's because by default, this voxel size comes in at 10 centimeters. So what we can do is actually go ahead and lower this, and what we're doing is essentially increasing the resolution of these volumes. And I want to point out, this is sort of an arbitrary number. It depends entirely on the scene size that you're working in, as well as the size of the object. So we kind of have to just eye this until we find something that we like. I'm going to go ahead and go a little bit lower, Let's drop it even down to 0.5 centimeters. This looks like something we can actually use. It's a pretty good, accurate representation of our gnome. Now, I do want to point out again, there's no polygons, but what we can do here is actually just bring in a volume mesher. And right away when I drag this in, you'll see most of our asset actually goes away, and that's because there's, there's this one setting that we need to address. There is voxel range threshold, and so by default, this comes in at 50%. And what we can do is actually just start to increase this and you'll see we just have to eye this until we find a setting that we like. That looks pretty good. And I wanna point out here, if I hide the disc really quickly and we jump under here, you'll see we have this opening at the bottom here. And what I wanna point out is this isn't a volume, you know, this isn't a uh, filled object. We have these sort of edges happening and that's because if I turn off the mesher for a second, these VDBs are essentially an infinitely thin wall. It's almost like a, if we had draped a cloth over this asset. And so by applying the mesher and in, in changing this voxel range threshold, we're actually essentially adding thickness to those walls. I'm gonna leave this around 70% looks pretty good. Now, what we can do to actually close off this hole though is actually bring back in our disk. And one of the really cool things happening here is that by feeding it into this volume tree that we've built, you can see here, we're actually sort of adding 
in this disk mesh before the meshing. And so what we're left with is actually a single uniform mesh. And yet it's flexible enough that we can still reposition the disk. And you can see this happening in real time. The other thing I want to point out here, I don't really think we need this sort of extra polygons around the base. You know, there's this lip here. I don't think we really need this. And so what we can do, let's just grab a cube. I'm going to scale this down a little bit. And I'm going to lower this actually. We'll put it right below for now. And what I can do is actually feed this into the volume tree as well. But what I want to do is go into the volume builder. And here you can see is the cube that we've just added. Let's change the mode from union to subtract. Now you see it disappears and that's because there's no overlap yet. But if I grab the cube again and I start to, let's just bump this up a little bit. And what you'll see happen is as these two start to intersect, this cube is actually going to be the driving force for where we're subtracting. There we go. Now we can see it happening. And so I can use this just as a very quick way to cap off any of those uh, unnecessary polygons in our lip. There we go. I think that's pretty good. Now this hole is back and that's because our cube is currently set one step higher in the hierarchy of our tree. So if I just come in here, let's grab the disc and we'll increase this one step. And now we can actually just reposition. Whoops. Let's grab the disc itself and we can just use this to help find. There we go. That's perfect. Now we've actually cleaned up that uh, any of those unnecessary polygons and still managed to cap off this hole. Okay, before I move on, I want to do one quick pass. Let's make sure we don't have any open holes in this mesh. Oh, it actually looks like there is right here. Um, so what you can see happening here is that the disc that we have actually isn't quite closing off this entire thing. So I can zoom in here and you'll see we're actually peeking inside the gnome. Now, we don't want this. We actually want this to be an entirely closed off mesh. So let's just bump this up a little bit. There you go. I think we can see we've closed that off. Let's make sure there's no other holes. Okay, looks good. Now, what I want to talk about next is how we can go about uh, sort of cleaning up any of these small little areas that still manage to carry over in our processing. This is a good example here. This is an area that we should be cleaning up uh, before our next steps. And so to do this, let's go ahead. I'm going to copy this so that we can keep a backup just in case. And let's go ahead and make this editable. So I'm going to right click, go down to select children. So we're selecting everything here in the hierarchy. Do that again, go to connect objects and delete. Now you can see here, we're looking at a single flat mesh. And one thing I want to point out now, before we actually go in and clean up the surface a little bit, if we go into our uh, polygon mode here and I zoom in, if I select all of these so that we're seeing the, all of the polygons selected, and I zoom in, let's go actually inside of this mesh. And one thing you're going to see here, there's actually a secondary mesh happening inside. And that's because of that, uh, sorry, um, voxel range threshold setting that we were messing with before. Remember, we were adding thickness to those infinitely thin walls. And by doing that, we actually created sort of a double sided polygon here. So we have this, this inner mesh that we need to get rid of uh, before we move forward. And so to do this, let's just grab our value mesh and I'm going to grab a single polygon here. Let's hit UW to do a group selection. And so what we're doing here, we're grabbing all of the polygons in this inside mesh. Remember, not the outside one, just what's happening inside. We can go ahead and delete this. And so now when I do a group selection, you can see now we're looking at proper uh, inverted normals on the inside and then proper facing normals on the outside. OK, now from here, let's go ahead and discuss how we can actually clean up some of these errors that are still on our mesh. And to do this, let's just jump over into the sculpting viewport. Let's grab our mesh. And all I want to, I just want to grab a few different tools here. So the first thing, let's just grab the smooth tool and all we have to do, let's just brush in some corrections here on this mesh. I'm going to actually make quite a bit of this smoother. You can actually see here even little, it's subtle, but little bumps like this is actually coming in. I'm going to guess Chris, from the tape that you had placed on this asset. Exactly. And it's even you're seeing the curvature got introduced because of the tape, but where the tape isn't actually, you see it smoothed it out a little bit. So he's got a real flat butt. Yes. <laughs> uh, but man, isn't the smoothing tool satisfying? Like look at it, just erase out those little errors and mistakes. Yes, it's doing a really good job, actually. I'm just going to keep doing this a little bit, clean up any of these little areas. Now, the snails seem to get a little bumpy. 
All right, that's looking pretty good here. Maybe just a little bit on the hand. Oh, this arm actually, oh yeah, there's a few areas down here as well. Keep going just a little bit. Can't tell if this was, yeah, did he have was hair? Supposed to be, no, that's just a missing chunk. Okay. That should be smoothed out, yeah. And yeah, and the hat ends up becoming a little, there's definitely some bumps in there from the tape. But oh it, yeah, that, you can really see it there. Yeah, so yeah, the tape has really appeared there. So yeah, you're racing all this out. It's actually really satisfying how how nice this tool is for doing this. And it's actually pretty forgiving. I, I like that these problems happened on our example here to show how much flexibility we have to go and fix the problems. Exactly. You can even see actually if I have the wireframe on, it might be even a better look at how we're doing things. Okay. And then maybe a little bit in this mustache there. Right yeah, above. that's a good, right there. Yeah. It's looking pretty good. Much better. Let's do one last little rotation here. Oh, there's an... What do you think? Looks pretty good? Yeah, maybe right around the back of his coat there. There's like a little bump. That's actually pretty smooth in the model. Uh, down in oh, right the lower there. part. Uh, right there. Right there. Yeah, that's in the, in the actual mesh. That's pretty smooth. And you can see it's a little geometric there. But yeah, that's looking good. Okay, and so I also want to point out here, as, as well as Cinema is doing actually with, uh, you know, handling this in the viewport, I do think we can actually be getting a much lower polygon count with this mesh, as well as more proper edge flow. In fact, if I zoom in here, you can see here, you know, we, we managed to convert this into quads with the, the VDB processing, which is great, um, but there is less than ideal edge flow. And that's gonna be quite a headache if we wanna do something like UV unwrap this and maybe some of the additional processing steps that we have in mind. So what we can do actually from here is we'll actually export this out and bring this into some other third party tools to actually clean this up even more. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this into a new scene file. And what we wanna do now is actually export this as an FBX to bring into, we're gonna try two different remeshing softwares today to give you guys a better idea of how to clean up this topology. Now I wanna point out, of course, Cinema 40 has its own workflows for this and that's actually very uh, capable and, and handy. But what I wanna show you guys is some really cool uh, third party tools that help speed up the process by actually offering more auto retopology algorithms. So let's just go ahead and Go to File, Export, we'll do an FBX, and let's just name this Gnome to Retapo. I'm gonna overwrite the last one. So one of the tools we'll actually be taking a look at is called 3D Coat. Let's take a look at the website really quickly. And so here you can see uh, 3D Coat is actually a really cool tool and it does a lot of different things. Everything from sculpting, modeling, texturing, UV unwrapping, uh, as well as retopology. And so one of the things we'll use that for today is some of its auto retopology algorithms. Now I do want to point out as well, you can see here, you can actually download this and you get a free 30 days trial. So this is an excellent tool to try out if you guys are interested in this process. All right, let's go ahead and load this in. And so right away, we won't dive too deep into the UI, but there's this button right here called perform retopology. And so let's click this and you'll see here, there's this new settings. Now there's a bunch of different options here. I just want to select perform auto retopology. Let's go ahead and load in this mesh. This is the gnome to retapo that we just saved out. And what we can do now, there are a lot of different settings here and we can actually just go ahead and let's try out iterating on different variations of this. I do wanna point out there's this auto retopology guide here. And if we click on this, we'll actually bring this up really quickly. And you can see here, uh, 3D code actually provides really nice documentation sort of helping explain what all of these different settings do. And so this is to help give you a better idea of how you should be approaching using this tool and the results that you can ultimately get. Of course, we're gonna be diving into this ourselves, but if you guys wanna dive in even deeper, take a look at this. Okay, so coming back, I think we can actually uh, decrease the required polygon count. This is actually gonna help drive the overall polygon count at the end of what we're exporting. Let's go ahead and lower this down to something like 5,000. I'm gonna leave capture details at 50%. Let's actually disable voxelize before quadra, 
what is that quadrant? It's like <laughs> Sorry. triangulation, but with quads. <laughs> there you go. Uh, quadrangulation. Thank you. Got it. Okay. And we can actually keep hard surface retopology disabled as well. Let's go ahead and hit OK. And we're going to actually ignore this step for now. But really what we can do here is if we have a mesh that has a lot of contrast in the uh, mesh density or the polygon density, we can actually use this to paint in areas where we want 3D code to be really focusing more on. Now, because we actually fed this into the VDB processing tools inside of R20, we actually don't have to worry about that because we have a very even uh, polygon distribution on this mesh. Let's go ahead and hit next. And we're gonna try to uh, advance without having to do this, but if you're having problems with your edge flow, if it's getting really confused, this tool is an excellent way that we can actually draw on the directional flow that we want this mesh to, to have. Now, that said, let's go ahead and see what it looks like without. Oh, it looks like the uh, the little quirk happened. Sometimes, I, I don't know, I don't understand why it does this, but sometimes during that process, sort of hiccups and gets frozen right here. So what we can do to actually fix this, let's just right click on our, our value mesh and we're going to try this again. We're going to go to auto retopo and we're going to click this again. Now we're bringing up all these settings, but we don't have to change any of these because it saved uh, everything that we just did. We'll try this again very quickly. I actually found that hit, hitting enter instead of clicking on next does tend to help quite a bit. So we're just going to hit enter a few times. And now you can see now it's processing this properly. So you didn't even change anything. You just ran it again. And last time it didn't like it. And this time it did. It happens to yeah. me too. It's just like, hey, run again. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what causes it, but you're right. Sometimes it, you just need to to rerun it through that process, and it'll it'll grab onto it this time. Okay, and we did it. That actually looks really good. Uh, I'm gonna zoom around and let's do a, a quick check to see how things are looking. I can actually hide this original mesh now, so we can see uh, uninterrupted the new mesh that we've created. And you know, it actually looks pretty good. Um, the edge flow is not perfect, but it does look significantly better. This is definitely something we can work with if we want to do something like UV unwrapping or maybe some of the other processing steps that we have in mind. But what do you think, Chris? Uh, I think it's looking pretty good. It's about half the density I did on some tests, but I really like the way that looks. So I'd be super happy continuing that. Cool. Now, again, I want to point out what we can do actually is just export this out. So export retopo object. We'll save this out. And one thing I'll, I'll point out, so let's do gnome and we'll do uh, LOD01. And if you wanted to you know take this back, we could we could do this again. We can we can say you know new mesh, we can bring in that mesh again. And if we wanted to do a few different variations of this to test out, you know, uh, the level of fidelity. Chris, you mentioned that was about half of some of your earlier tests. So what we could hypothetically do is, you know, come in here and let's let's increase this a little bit. Maybe not quite that. Let's do like seven. 7,500. And if we just ran through this again, let me do this. Let's see if we can get one step higher just so that we have two options in case we want to move forward. Okay, now we can see if we zoom in here. You know, the, the edge flow is actually looking maybe even a little bit better here. We're definitely capturing some more details, obviously more polygons on the mesh, uh, but maybe this is a good option to have as well. Let's go ahead and save this out as well. And I'm gonna name this one LOD2. Okay, and so from here, let's actually go ahead and take a look at the other tool. So say maybe you're bringing a mesh into 3D code and for whatever reason, it's just not working. Or maybe you just want an absolutely free alternative to this tool. That tool is actually called Instant Meshes. I'm gonna pull up a website for that as well. So here you can see, this is actually a really cool sort of more experimental tool. I actually think it started off as more of an academic paper that was built into this tool. And I wanna give a quick shout out to the creator, Wenzel Jacob, or is it Jacob Wenzel? Let's see here. Probably Wenzel Jacob. And you can see here, uh, we're on GitHub, so it looks a little complicated, but actually downloading this, all you have to do is go to this pre-compiled binaries, and we click on this Microsoft Windows version. And so this is sort of a pre-packaged version, uh, ready to run straight on Windows 10. I do want to point out, it's also supported on Mac, so you have options here as well as Linux. And if we load this in, you can see here I've got this. So right away this comes up. I do want to point out one thing that we forgot to do actually. So earlier with our mesh, we had saved this out as an FBX file for bringing into 3D code. Unfortunately though, Instant Meshes actually only works with OBJs. And so let's jump back really quickly. We're gonna do the same thing, but this time I want to save this out as an OBJ. 
and let's do gnome to instant. Okay, now let's jump back into instant meshes. And this is a very, you're gonna see a lot of similarities in these workflows. Let's go ahead and hit open mesh. And here's that gnome to instant. So you can see we're bringing the mesh in. Now there are a few very small differences in this mesh. One thing I wanna, or in this, this tool, one thing I wanna point out. So we can define here, uh, if we wanna be exporting out quads, there's different algorithms for how those quads are calculated as well as triangles. And there are a few other settings here in terms of defining. If you're working with like hard surface meshes, you might get better results or have a better chance at getting uh, a clean mesh if you're using aligned boundaries as well as sharp creases. For this mesh, I don't think we have to worry about that. Again, we're defining our uh, polygon count output size just like we were in 3D Code with a target vertex count here. And where this tool actually functions a little bit differently is when we click solve, you can see we're actually getting a preview here of how instant meshes is understanding the edge flow. So you can almost imagine once this is actually applied uh, polygons to, we can see if we click the next step, this is actually sort of the, the edge flow that we'll be getting. Now it's not perfect. In fact, because we can preview this, we actually have the advantage of maybe correcting some of this before we actually have our polygon mesh. If we look at here, you can see there, here's a good example on the hat. You know, ideally, I'd have sort of a, a much more vertical straight orientation for these polygons. Currently they're sort of wrapping and winding around. And we can fix this now inside of instant meshes by enabling this brush tool and simply brushing on the orientation that we want these to follow. You can see right away, as I brush that in, uh, the estimation is actually updating and giving us uh, more feedback now based on that line that I placed. And we can do this everywhere. So I can zoom back around. Let's look for some more areas. Okay, on the back, you can see it's kind of doing this as well. We can do another straight one. And I do want to point out, as you're adding these lines, you have to be careful because this is adding more complexities, more rules essentially that Instant Meshes has to take into consideration when it's actually meshing this. So you wanna be careful. You don't wanna have any overlapping lines um, or lines placed too closely together. You just really wanna use this conservatively in areas where it needs it the most. This is actually a good area right here where we can place this. There you go, that's looking quite a bit better. I think this is good for now. And so what we can do from here is actually click Export Mesh and click Extract Mesh. And so you'll see we're actually able to extract a polygon mesh from this. And one of the really cool things here is there's actually this smoothing iterations tool as well. And so if we wanna smoothen this out, we can actually increase these and click Extract again. And you'll see we're actually increasing the overall smoothness. It's almost like applying a subdivision surface to this, but without actually adding more polygons. That said, let's go ahead and decrease this back. And let's say maybe we actually went too far. Maybe this is not enough polygons uh, for our mesh. We can actually just go ahead and increase our target vertex count again. We're gonna click yes. And we can just click solve and we can click, we can go through all these again. And it's actually saving all of those. Oh, normally it saves all the brushes. That's a bummer that it didn't this time. So, you know, we could go through the whole process again. We could kind of really quickly place them just in areas where it matters. Oops, let's not use that one. <laughs> You know, it's actually doing pretty well. Maybe we don't have to place all of them this time. And now when we click extract again, you'll see we're actually applying, we're baking in more polygons. This, this looks maybe a little bit better. Now, both of these tools are completely valid options. Actually, before I do that, let's go ahead and save this out as well. And we'll do gnome LOD01, and I'll save this with an instant tag just so we are able to keep track. Oh, one thing to point out, this tool works a little bit differently. Let's bring this back instant you do actually have to type in the obj at the end otherwise it gets confused about how it should be formatting everything so now we've saved out two different versions let's go ahead and we'll jump back into cinema and i want to merge in i'm going to hit Control shift o to actually bring up uh, a merge action and let's grab the gnome lod one that we built or you know what which one did we like more I think you like the second one more real quick question. What's your little preview going on here? Oh, you know, I don't think I installed anything special. I think this is what probably the latest windows 10 update, <laughs> I believe added, added uh, an OBJ preview for when you have an app, uh, an asset selected. I think I, I might be in a special. Yeah. So there's this extra panel button up here in windows 10 that you can click. 
No, that's cool. Yeah, it's a good way to, to preview, I guess, what we're doing. Um, in fact, you can see here, actually, this is an interesting difference. Oh, wait, no, that, sorry, this is GNOME 2 instance. So this was the source mesh that we brought into Instant. And then this is what we're actually exporting out of 3D Code. Let's go ahead and load this one in. Uh-oh. No, no, you've got oh, your, the there menu's it over is. There. I was like, what's <laughs> going on? It's tucked away. All right, we'll jump back into the startup. And um, so it looks like the material that we had applied actually has transparency enabled. So we can just disable this and you'll see. But we actually don't even need this material. So we can just go ahead and delete this. And I think by default, it comes in with normals settings. I like to delete this and then just change our fong tag to 180 degrees. And so now you can see if we turn on our wireframe mode, you can see, look at how much cleaner the topology is now on this mesh. Remember, if we jump over to uh, our previous file, let's actually bring this in really quickly. And you can see if we do a quick side-by-side -side comparison, look at how much uh, cleaner and, and lighter this new mesh is, all while not really giving up too much details. Of course, there is you know a much smoother surface, but we'll discuss in some of the next steps how we can be bringing some of those details back. Okay, so we've done a great job of cleaning up this mesh, but the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is uh, UVs. So what we want to be doing now is actually properly UV unwrapping this asset for some of the next steps like texturing, as well as transferring over some of those details that we might have lost in this processing. And to do this, I'm actually going to go ahead and let's delete the original one. I want to save this out so that we can send this to Chris because he's going to show us how to uh, UV unwrap this inside of Cinema 4D. But I also then want to show you guys how we can use some third party tools such as Rhizom UV, which has an excellent Cinema 4D bridge to actually be unwrapping this in other ways. OK, here we are back on my machine. The file from Aaron has synced up so I can go and grab this unwrapped gnome or to be unwrapped gnome and here we go We've got this nice clean mesh everything's looking good and here we want to use the built-in tools inside of cinema 4d to do the unwrapping now this might not be the most like technically like perfect one but i've done lots of tests with this so far and it's always worked like pretty well like well enough for our purposes here so what we want to do is find a couple places to cut this apart so that we can unwrap it. And I think one of the basic ideas is we want to hide a seam somewhere and the back of the gnome seems like a pretty good place. So I'm going to just go to edge mode here and start drawing a path of where it should be cut. Kind of picture that we're like, uh, have a, a teddy bear and we're going to like open it up and lay it flat like it's a pattern that we're going to cut out. So I'm going to hit UM, which is a shortcut for path selection. What that means is I can just start drawing out a path and drawing this wherever I want to go. There's a couple nice features with this tool and we'll just wait until I naturally make a mistake. That part went fine. Now you see as I, tr as I trace down, it's actually going a little bit far off to the leg. I'd kind of like it to be a little bit more centered, but maybe we'll just go right there and then travel along the side of the coat and then go more towards the middle. And this is all pretty arbitrary. I'm just trying to go through areas that are slightly less detailed so let's maybe travel a little bit more towards the middle there and down. In an ideal world, maybe I would have traveled up that one. Actually, why don't we do that? If I hold down control, I can rewind or erase out that one that I had. So now here, let's start with where we know we want to go, which is right down the middle between the pants there. And we'll travel up and connect here. We could also have traveled over there and over there, whatever path we want to take. So we'll just do that. That's fine. And then let's continue traveling down. We just got to pick our path. So maybe we will travel along the side of the boot here a little bit right here. I like this angle. And then from there, we will travel down to the edge. So that's kind of the cut down the back. Now, if we wanted to, if this one is a little messy for us, we could say, nope, not that one. And then we could travel up this one. But you'll see that this starts traveling us down that edge, which could be fine. We go up here to around the area where the hat is beginning. And then that could become a separate cut that we travel up. And actually along those lines, that's what I want to do next is maybe cut along the edge of where the hat will be. So we've got his hair here. Maybe I'll travel down and around here. I just know that's approximately where the hat is. So we can clean this up by traveling there. Where's that? It's not worth overthinking this. I think we'll be running at enough of a resolution where the particulars aren't going to matter that much. But let's go ahead and trace over here. Let's continue this path around where his hair is and then finish that connection. So this entire hat, you see we've got a cut completely around the entire thing. So that will completely separate that out. 
Uh, and the last thing I want to do is probably just do a loop around the bottom here. Let's see if we got a nice edge loop I can work from. Unfortunately, none of these quite seem to be working. You see the path gets really weird. But I'm actually kind of free to go a little bit further in, like right there. And we can just use that one as our path. It does a pretty good cut around. I'll just hit UM again and make sure you complete this cut. So this entire thing will be cut out. And then this outer part can just get unwrapped around to the rest of the object. And actually, I think that would be okay because it'll just make it so we're curving around that nicely and the seam will be hidden underneath the entire object and honestly I think that's all I want to do actually that's not entirely true but we will do it wrong right now and then do it right in a second so we've got our cuts that we think we want let's go ahead to our body paint UV edit layout here it's kind of behind my picture but if you click on layout you go to UV edit and it's going to pop open and now we want to go ahead and make sure we add a UV mesh on here. Didn't you say there was a button to make it right away, Aaron? I don't remember where you had that. Um, I created yeah. a material, apply the material. You just have to have like a standard white material applied to it. And then you can do, I think, tags, generate UVW tag. Ah, yeah. So yeah, I can right click on that material and say generate UVW tag. So it actually makes a tag for him because we need this tag. The other way I used to do it would be uh, to create some sort of object. Of course, that menu has disappeared. But I'd like create a cube, make it edible, and steal the tag from it. But uh, any way you can get this UV tag, now we've got it. It automatically appeared in this viewport in our unwrapping over here. But if you don't see it, make sure you drag your mesh over or the tag over, and it will appear here. So you see right now it's a giant mess. We actually are getting something somewhat reasonable, but this is definitely not what we want to work from. So what I want to do is go to our UV polygon tool right here. So this is actually how we select our polygons when we're in UV mode. And we want to set some sort of projection. The easy workflow here is just to go to the projection menu down here and say frontal. And it's just really a projection of the entire gnome from the current point of view. So it just makes a nice new clean mesh and everything's connected the way it's supposed to be. Now we can go to relax UV. And we just have our two smoothing algorithms here, our relaxing algorithms, which is ABF and LSCM. They're just two different algorithms. I usually just try both and see if I like the way they look. So right now we've got a cut selected edges checkbox turned on, and we already know we have those edges selected. So all I have to do is hit apply, and it's going to process, and boom, it is now going to create a mesh for us. Now, the part I was saying we're going to do wrong, we're going to see here. You can see that we've got all these overlapping polygons. The reason that this has happened is there's actually a hole inside of this character. Behind his cane, there's a hole that travels right through here, and it doesn't know what to do with that hole. It's a very confusing for the unwrapping. So let's go back to our standard, or our startup layout. And let's make an additional cut there. So if I go back to edge mode, you see my cuts are still there. Let's go ahead and make two, well, three additional cuts. So I'm gonna try a loop selection. I'll see if there's a nice loop right there. Perfect, we got a loop right there. And let's also do a cut loop here, see if one is gonna be cooperative, that one is. And I just wanna do one extra slice to connect the two of these together. So I'm gonna hit UM and let's go ahead and make a cut someplace where our camera is not gonna see it very clearly. Let's scoot over to this side. It's a little hard to see where that is. I'm going to have to get way inside here. There we go. It's right there. Travel this across until it is indeed connected to this side. So we made a couple extra cuts. Let's go back to our UV edit menu. Pop it open. And let's just go ahead and run the algorithm again. I'm going to hit apply. And there we go. Now you see it actually did a really nice job of unwrapping because it wasn't trying to bridge these two holes. And so now we get two holes in there. And that separate object has become, I think, this unwrapped piece. Actually, that's the bottom. So I'm not sure where that last piece went. It's hiding somewhere. Um, oh, it's really tiny. There it is. This is what we just cut out. So you see the scale is way off on all of these. Now let's go ahead and try the other algorithm. I don't know if we can just switch to it and hit apply. I think it might just relax it. No, it seems to have completely recut it. So you see, it's a very different kind of layout. In this particular instance, I happen to like the way ABF was looking a little bit better. So let's go ahead and run that one again. And you see, this is pretty dang even. I'm actually pretty impressed with that. The scaling is all out of whack. You can see this is the hat. So the hat shouldn't be anywhere near this big. So I'm going to go back to our UV polygon tool. Let's go ahead and click on... I'm going to hit spacebar to go to selection. Let's just grab one of these. Hit UW to grab all of them. T for scale, and I'm going to scale these way down because that should not be taking up a majority of our menu, of our, our UV layout. Let's go ahead and grab this little guy, hit UW, and I'm just going to move it off to the side for now. And let's hit T for scale because it is pretty tiny. I just don't want to lose it, so we'll make that bigger. 
Uh, let's grab this one, which is the underside of the gnome. Hit UW. I'm going to scoot that off the side. And now let's just, and even let's grab this one and hit UW. I'm just going to pull all of these completely off the UV layout here, our grid. And I just want to grab our main chunk, which is where it's the majority of the gnome. You can even see all these polygons selected. This is where we need the detail. So let's go ahead and let this take up the lion's share of our entire layout here. I'm going to hit T for scale. And let's just scale this up nice and big. And I'm going to scoot this anywhere I need to, to kind of have it fill up as much area as possible. T for scale. There we go. It's eating up lots of space. So now we can just grab the other ones and put them wherever they fit to eat up kind of an equivalent amount of area. All the polygons are pretty even. So if I hit T for scale, I want to scale this up until these polygons are about the same size as the rest of it. Uh, scoot it in. I want the entire thing in the map. So let's hit R for rotate. We're going to spin that around a little bit. E for move. Scoot it there. There we go. Now they're living together. Grab the hat, UW. Let's move this one. E for move. Scoot it down here. It's already almost fitting. R for rotate, and we'll spin it around like that. I think that's going to be our best bet. Polygons are already pretty good for the scale. Hit T for scale, make, you make it a little bit bigger. And let's see, that seems to lay pretty well. And now we can grab the bottom panel, E. We'll scoot this in. You'll see that these are pretty tiny, so we hit T for scale, scale them up. Pretty much just eat up as much room as we can down here because it would just be wasted space otherwise. And actually, this is this is better than I usually get. This is a pretty good layout. You'll see all of our polygons are pretty even. Uh, unfortunately, areas like this where I think this is kind of his hand, or actually this right here is probably the snail. You can see here's the side, there's the top of the snail, and here's kind of his head. That's These polygons are a little smaller, so there's less detail there. I would love to scale those up a little bit to give them more detail. We actually can do that here in the UVs. It's just a little bit of a pain. Actually, there are some scaling tools. If we were to go hit UW and select all those, I could go to the magnet tool right here. And if I were to click and start dragging, you could see that it will drag out. And there's no scaling tool, but I could start kind of grabbing the edges around here and squishing everything around to the point where you see those will start getting becoming kind of relatively a little bit bigger than those neighbors. It just stretches them out so those get more love when it comes to the, uh, the final pixels. So we could kind of push and pull these around. But honestly, this is pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to our startup layout. Pop it back up here. And I'm going to give this another quick save, put it into the file, uh, into our shared folder here as I'll just do unwrapped and hit save and then uh, pass this back to Aaron again to do the other layout in the other Let's piece of software. Okay, and so I also want to show you guys a really cool alternative uh, tool to use for UV unwrapping called Rhizom UV. Let's actually take a look at their website very quickly. So Rhizom is actually a third-party tool. It's a standalone application that's entirely dedicated just to UV unwrapping. And the really cool thing here, I want to point out, they have a very, very generous uh, subscription model. And so there are actually two different versions. We want to be using the virtual spaces because this is also actually an application used for real space, you know, like package design stuff. But we want to be working in the virtual spaces. And they have a 30-day demo. It's for Mac and Windows. Um, and then they actually have an indie licensing uh, that is actually very, very cool. And so you, there's this rent-to-own model where you're paying, what is it, 15 euro, which is basically $18, $20 uh, per month to, to uh, have access to the application. But it's also a rent-to-own model. And so that means over time, you're actually building up those credits to where you can actually acquire a perpetual even through the subscription model. Okay, that said, let's jump in. Okay, so there's actually a lot of really cool features that Rhizom UV offers, and I want to get to as many of them as I can today. But the number one thing I want to show first is that it actually has an excellent Cinema 4D bridge. And so inside of Cinema 4D, I can actually have my mesh selected, go into the, the plugins section here, and you'll see I have this Rhizom UV exporter loaded in. There's a bunch of settings here. We want to click this export to UV option, but I actually have this pre docked right here. So we can just go ahead and click this. And you'll see right away, uh, Rhizom's actually opening up, taking that object that we had selected inside of Cinema 40, and we've successfully imported it here. Now, I do want to show off as much of this as I can. There's a lot of different UI stuff we won't dive into today. 
but there's a few different things I'll discuss. So on the left here is this viewport where we're actually seeing a 3D uh, representation of the asset. So we can you know, rotate around, we can zoom in, we can select specific edges or polygons. And then on the right is this 2D flat view where we'll actually be previewing the UV layout. Now, right now we're seeing this sort of weird flat perspective view of the mesh, and that's just because we haven't actually given Rhizom any edges uh, as, a, as a guide for how it's unwrapping. And so let's go ahead and do that. The first thing I want to show off uh, just by, or the first thing I want to do to show off one of these new tools is actually if I click F3 on my keyboard, I can switch into polygon mode. So you can see here, I'm actually selecting polygons rather than edges. And I have this already selected, but with this magic wand tool here on the right, I can enable deviation. And what this is going to do is just uh, sort of look at the normals orientation on these polygons and use that as a as a guide for uh, how it should be selecting the polygons. And we can use this very quickly to make a selection here on our bottom cap. And so, you know, of course, I could spend time uh, really cleaning up these these edges, but let's just keep moving kind of quickly. And so, with these polygons selected, you can see right now we haven't actually applied any cuts, and so there's no updates happening here on the right. And to do this with these edges or with these polygons selected. Selected. Let's just click the C key on our keyboard. You could also click this cut tool right up here. And so right when I do this, you'll see we actually have an orange outline now on these polygons that we had selected. In fact, if I click off, you'll see. So this is actually where we've placed our first cut on the asset. From here, let's go ahead and click F2 to swap into a polygon or I'm sorry, an edge selection mode. So I can be selecting specific edges. We're going to zoom out a little bit here and let's find a loop that we can grab that's pretty clean here on the gnome itself. That one's pretty good. So we're actually going all the way down to the bottom, connecting here with this bottom uh, cap that we've created, or the island, and it actually looks like it goes straight up to the hat and it stops here. So this is perfect. I'm gonna hit C as well to place a cut here. And now I want to actually apply these cuts because you can see here, we're actually still looking at this weird sort of flat perspective view. And to do this, I needed to unfold this asset. So I can click this button here or I could just hit U on my keyboard. And so now you can see we actually saw a change. If I click F, we're going to frame everything that we just did. And so now you can see uh, this asset uh, or the, the cuts that we placed here are actually unfolding into this flat shape. I do want to point out Rhizom does this unique thing that uh, where it actually has this color grid. And what this is telling me is that uh, any sort of neutral gray values are perfectly balanced uh, texel density. So we're not looking at, it, at any distortion issues here. And wherever we see blue and red, you can see they are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So we're looking at either stretching or really compress, uh, compressing these, these islands. In fact, we can actually see this much more apparently if I turn on my grid here to preview and we zoom in. So you can see actually what's happening here is in these areas of red and blue, we're looking at pretty significant UV distortion. And to fix this, actually, you know, Chris addressed this area here, um, and I think this is actually a really good point of reference that we can we can uh, we can clean up on. But actually, you know what? Before we do that, I want to point out one of I think my favorite feature inside of Rhizom UV, which is that if I click F4 on the keyboard and I have this island selected here, F4 switches you into island selection mode. You can see on this big main island, we're actually looking at a lot of overlap on our UVs. This is definitely not ideal for any sort of texturing or maybe some of these next steps. So what we can do from here is having this island selected, I can go up and I can click this optimize button, or again, I can uh, use the hotkey that it's uh, applied to, which is O. I'm gonna hold down O, and what you'll see is uh, Rhizom actually does a series of optimization passes. So it's sort of iterating, it's figuring out how to be best balancing and distributing these these uh, these uh, polygons while also clearing up any sort of overlapping. And this is actually kind of a very fun and relaxing uh, process to watch happen. Okay, so now it looks like it's slowing down. I think that means that we've done all of the optimization passes that we can on this. If I click off, I wanna repack this because you can see now by doing that, we actually sort of shifted things around quite a bit. And so if I hit the P key or come up here and click this pack button, I can repack these, so it's actually repositioning everything, trying to take advantage of as much of this UV grid space as possible. And now if I zoom in here, there's this space that Chris had talked about earlier, and all we need to do is the same exact thing. Let's just place another loop 
right around here. I know he did a, actually a few extra cuts, but I think we can get away with just doing one loop right here. Let's click C again to do a cut. And now if I zoom out, you can see we've got this here. It's not being applied and that's because we have to unwrap this asset again. I'm just gonna hit U. And now you can see we're actually, remember we're, we're overlapping a little bit and that's because we have to pack this one last time. And now we can see when I zoom out, it's, you know, it's not perfect. There's definitely some little areas of distortion and maybe I'd spend some extra time adding some additional cuts to clean up these areas. But you know what? I kind of like the fact that there's not a lot of seams that we have to worry about. There's only this main seam here on the back um, that's gonna be visible and that's gonna be great for when we ultimately texture this asset. So from here, I think we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and save this out. Now, the really cool thing with Rhizom and this bridge is that I don't actually have to export out an FBX or an OBJ to get this back into cinema. All I have to do is hit Control S to save this. And as soon as I do, Rhizom closes, it actually re-imports that mesh that we were just working with and it actually hides the original. So remember, this is the mesh that we originally had and sent over. You can see it's actually hidden that in the viewport. We've got our new mesh here. If I select this, and I go into body paint UV edit mode, here you can see those UVs are coming in properly and so we've successfully processed this mesh. Okay, now we are to the exciting part. This is the part where I knew we had to record a tutorial because this is just the magical part where when you told me about this bit of the technique <laughs> and this is where you just, just did not have time to talk about this at your NAB presentation. And when, when you mentioned it to me, you didn't even explain very far and you told me the basic idea. I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> so let's jump right on in so people can see my favorite part. Okay, so from here, let's go ahead and jump back into the startup layout. And here's this mesh that we've fully processed at this point. So we've got proper low poly uh, edge flow and, and topology. We've also got a new UV unwrap. And you can see here, here's the UV tags for that. Let's go ahead and copy this. And I wanna bring this back into the uh, original file that Chris had actually sent me with the scan data. So let's, let's go ahead and paste this in. And you can see here, remember if I turn on the wireframe, so this is actually the messy topology uh, scan actually coming in directly from Meshroom. And there's a few things I wanna point out here. So of course we've got messy topology and if I, you know, we can actually drag this out of the disc because we don't need that anymore. And if I have this mesh selected and jump back into the body paint UV edit mode, you can see here, look at how messy the UVs were uh, coming in for Meshroom. And that's because Meshroom's applying sort of an auto unwrapping algorithm and it works. I mean, we've got, you know, the textures coming in, but it's definitely not ideal. And the problem actually is that they're so drastically different from our new mesh. Look how clean and organized these are. And really the problem with that is that if I jump in here to our folder, here are the actual texture uh, files that are actually being exported out of Meshroom. And so you can see these are embedded and uh, referencing the messy UV layout from our scan. And so the problem is if I wanted to drag in and apply this to our new cleaned up UVs, they're actually not gonna correlate. There's gonna be no connection between what you're seeing on those textures and what we see here. And so essentially what we need to do is a UV transfer almost, where we're actually transferring uh, the data that's being mapped from the messy UVs onto these new clean ones. And to do this, it's actually a really cool technique. It's a little hacky, but it's actually really fun. So all we're gonna do, let's to keep things straight, let's rename our low poly mesh as low. We'll name the old raw scan as just raw. And the first thing, let's grab our low poly mesh. I wanna go into the um, polygon selection and let's select all of the polygons you see here. I wanna right click, go to nor uh, normal move and we can actually just start to oops, scale this up. And so what we wanna do here is eliminate any of these areas where our low poly mesh is sort of uh, clipping and intersecting with the underlying raw scan. So if I start to scan this up a little bit, I think that looks pretty good there. Let's see if there's any other areas Yep, down here on the shoe, on the butt a little bit, and looks like a little bit here. Let's see, that should be pretty good. Yep, okay, so we're not clipping through anywhere now. 
And with all of these polygons selected, let's go ahead and hit UR on our keyboard. And this is to invert the actual normal selection, so, or orientation. So now all of our normals are actually facing inward. In fact, if I zoom in and we actually clip through this for a second, you can see exactly what's happening. So all of our normals are actually facing inward towards that underlying raw scan. From here, the next thing I want to do is actually double click on our shelf down here to create just a very standard Cinema 4D material. Let's disable the color. And in the reflectance, I want to remove what we currently have. Let's add a GGX material. And I want to disable or turn down all of the roughness. So we're essentially looking at a pure, almost like a mirror material being applied to our low poly uh, version of this gnome. Now from here, I want to show you one last thing. So if we disable this low poly mesh for a second, what I want to do is add a light into the scene and let's actually enable ambient illumination. And so when I do this, you can see we're actually removing any sort of environmental effects on this mesh. So we're getting rid of any sort of default shadows or highlights, any sort of lighting. We're looking basically at the pure uh, albedo or diffuse map of our textures. And the next step from here is actually to let's bring back our low poly mesh. I want to right click on this, go into Cinema 4D tags and apply a bake texture tag. Now there's a bunch of settings here if we jump into the tag, uh, but the first thing I want to do is actually set a directory for where we'll be saving out our image. Let's go ahead and set this, set this here. I'm going to name this UV transfer. And I want to make sure I'm working it in 16 bit for the depth. And that's important just because I don't want to be compressing any of the data that we'll be gathering. Let's go ahead and increase the output size a little bit. You know, I'm going to go as high as like 4K, I think, for this. So we can really get some nice details. I want to increase the super sampling. And really all this is doing is just adding a little bit of anti-aliasing onto the edges of the UVs that we'll be transferring. So really it's just about adding a little bit more quality to it. And for the pixel border, let's go ahead and uh, extend this a little bit from one to something like 10. And this is just going to add a little bit of padding onto the UVs that we're making. I'll show you exactly what I mean by that here in a second. All right, let's jump into the options tab now. There's a bunch of different settings, but again, all we have to worry about is just one option. Let's enable reflection. And so now when I hit preview, you'll see Cinema's actually baking out sort of a very quick, low resolution uh, thumbnail. Now this is not a final representation of what we'll actually be baking, but this is simply a way for me to double check and confirm that there is information being captured. And really what's happening here is you can see we're actually targeting the reflections channel of our GGX material. And because this is essentially a mirror and our normals on this mesh are actually facing inward, what we're baking out is the reflection happening from inside of this mesh being applied uh, through, or sorry, that, that's being applied on the actual scanned mesh. So from here, let's go ahead and actually click bake. It's gonna take a little bit longer, but what you'll see happening is that Cinema's actually baking out what appears to be a proper map. Woo! We're gonna give us a little bit, I know, right? This is the big <laughs> magic moment. That's, that's the magic. <laughs> that's where you, you said, you said just throw a bake on there in an inverse normal reflection. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's, Boom. it's the magic moment. Done. So if I bring, if I bring in now, let's see here, we can target, let's see if I can find this really quickly. It might've gotten messed up in our uh, destination. So actually it's, it's baking out as a, as a Photoshop file. I might've forgot to enable or set it as, yeah, I had it as a PSD. Normally I like to work in PNGs, but yeah, that's fine. That's great. Um, and so actually I'll, you know what, I'll hand it off here and I'll let Chris handle this. But what we need to do from here is actually clean up and sort of uh, shrink this mesh back down because we've actually inflated it a little bit in that process. And then Chris, you actually have some really cool ideas for how to clean up a little bit of that texture that we just baked out. Okay, so here we are back on my machine. What I'm going to do is pop open the UV transfer, which is right before Aaron had kind of inflated it out. So now we're kind of back to the, the good unwrapped mesh that we had. I'm gonna hide our original one. Why don't we go ahead and rename it raw and low just to match what Aaron was doing. And let's go ahead and make a new material and try and apply the one that he just baked out directly to our mesh. I'm gonna turn off the reflectance layer. Let's go into color. Let's go ahead and open up a file. Here we are in the folder. Here's the file Aaron saved out. Let's create that and just apply it directly. It defaults to UVW, of course, and look at that. 
directly applied, and the material is working fine on the uninflated low poly mesh of our gnome. Let's go ahead and immediately tell it to show the high res version. So I'm going to go to editor inside of the material and change texture preview size to no scaling. So we're going to be seeing the 4K directly in our viewport. I'm going to hit NA so that we don't see our polygons. And now you can see we've got everything transferred to our low poly mesh, which is right there automatically amazing like that trick is so cool <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and spend a little bit of time in photoshop so i'm gonna pop photoshop open let's get our folder open i'm gonna drag in our file and let's start playing around with this the first thing i always do is duplicate my layer i'm gonna do a control or command j i'm gonna hide the one underneath it and i think i might even mask this out immediately so i'm going to just go ahead and do a wand magic wand selection select all of the white on the edge and I've already got uh, contiguous turned off, so it does select in between all the little holes and everything. And I'm just going to hit Control X, delete all of that, so now I've kind of got it on a transparent layer. So now I can start manipulating this however I like and not worry about the original being affected. So something that I found, I was kind of shocked, I hit the layer F, so we zoom, can navigate more easily here in Photoshop. A tool I never use is the healing brush. We've got the spot healing brush tool. The shortcut there is a letter J. And this tool is kind of like the clone stamp tool, except it's automatically trying to figure out what to put in its place. So while we've got that tool selected, let's go ahead and make sure that the brush is pretty soft. So here's the hardness. It's already pretty good. I'm going to do about 50%. And it's a little big. Keep in mind, you can just use your uh, brackets, uh, the bracket keys on your keyboard. And I can shrink that, this to about the size. Now we can see we've got all of these little layers of tape that I had taped onto it in order to scan it better. Well, we need to get rid of those, but I figured it'd be pretty easy to get rid of them. But I was shocked that we can just use this brush tool and paint over one of them. And it actually does a really good job of erasing it out. Now, if this was like a proper photograph, this might be a lot tougher because you know you'd need really good continuity but the resolution on this image isn't like insanely amazing you can see we've it's not pixelated it's more like we're seeing individual little polygons so i we've got a lot of tolerance here a lot of leeway in the way we're going to apply it so uh we're just going to meticulously go through here and start erasing these out you see i'm not quite going to the edge because i want to spend extra care on those now we're the spot tool uh, where this uh, healing brush is working really well is as I erase these parts out, it's doing a really great job of matching the color underneath it. I'm actually going to undo that one. And if we were to use the, the normal stamp tool, which would be kind of our normal go-to, if I hold down alt or option, click the corner here and I start covering this up, what's going to happen really quickly is it's not going to be matching the color terribly well. It's not bad, but you see, especially down here, the color isn't matching that well, but our spot healing brush as I paint over here is automatically finding areas that look very similar in color and this isn't limited to us just erasing out those uh these bits of tape if I go to these areas where they're kind of the polygons are in are particularly kind of uh big I can just kind of go over them and you see it's doing a good job of replacing them with something a little bit better you see over here pretty low res looking let's just paint over that and yeah, just kind of keep cleaning these up. So we'll probably do a quick little time lapse here as I go through and erase out all these bits of tape. So I'll see you on the other end. Okay, so I just got rid of most of the tape except for the edges, but I want to give that a little bit of special attention. Also, we've got these different spots and I didn't want to uh, skip over those. It is kind of important to go and th these parts, I had a lot more trouble figuring out what to do with them. Um, and I think we can, I think I feel safe just going and, and painting over it. These are where the holes are, but those would just immediately reconnect with each other. So I'm fairly confident in that. I'm also finding little areas that jump out a little bit like a little, a little chunkier areas. I'm letting those just get a little bit more fixed. Um, so we'll keep finding those as we go. The un underside of this hand did not do terribly well, but we'll just let that fill in there a little cleaner. We can always give a little bit more love to our snail here. 
He's looking pretty good. Uh, there's a little bit of bleed here on the face. That bugs me. So I'm going to actually do a stamp tool because I don't think the uh, I don't think the other one, the uh, healing brush, would do a very good job of cleaning that. But we'll do that, and then even here, a little paint. Hey, here you see that's where the colored stuff doesn't match up. I don't think that's any worse than what we were seeing in other spots. And I'll just use the uh, healing brush now to clean that up a little, a little patchy here, and even here. These start looking a little scraped up. Although, I mean, some of those imperfections could be detail, like those could be good. But I just like this transition being a little bit better. These get a little spotty. So, yeah, that's pretty good. Let's get a little bit of a better transition there. A little, little polygonal there. This over here is very polygonal. I'm not going to worry too much about it. And maybe we'll run like an, a blur over this entire thing. But when, this, when you're zoomed out from the gnome on the actual final, I don't think those stand out that much. But let's go ahead and get the, the ones that stand out to us cleaned up. So that's going really, it's, it's really, this is kind of uh, very zen. It's very uh, simple, clean method. You don't have to stress out over this part. Um, so uh, the one thing that we do have to stress out is trying to clean up these edges um, where the tape is on the edge. So what I'm going to do is actually do a, another wand selection around the entire outside. And then I'm going to hold down control shift I to invert that selection so that it's not looking outside of that. And let's see if the spot tool works. And it does. Um, the trick is that where this is meeting the seam on the opposite side, it could actually show some difference. So we want to be careful. And you see this one's actually not working. So I'm going to use the, uh, the clone stamp tool to clean this one up a little bit. And uh, yeah, and we'll just keep kind of alternating between those two tools and seeing how well it fixes it. Like that did okay, but it's not quite the right color. So I'll just clone stamp that one in. Honestly, I don't want to stress out over these individual details too much. In fact, what I could do right now is just hit save and uh, it's asking for compatibility. I'm saying go ahead and let's tab back over to Cinema 4D. And if I jump back into our material, I can just go into our color channel, click on the material and say reload texture. And you're gonna see it's gonna update. And we're gonna start seeing it in the viewport and I can make sure that everything's working pretty well. Now we know our seam was traveling right up the back here and we are indeed seeing that there's a little bit of a seam there. Honestly, it's not something I'm terribly worried about. It's hiding on the back of the gnome here. Um, the little places where the tape was, actually you can see right here, there's a tiny seam there. Um, Photoshop is not super well equipped to deal with that. Like if we were in body paint, we're actually painting here, we might be able to clone onto that. But in this instance, uh, it's just going to sort of break that. Now there is one thing that I'm going to to do here and it's kind of a risky thing we have to see if it's going to work or not and i'm not entirely sure that it will i'm gonna give it a quick save and what i'm going to do is duplicate our entire layer and i'm going to go to our filter and i'm going to say blur and i'm going to blur this quite a bit and what i want to do is see if i can extract out a little bit of the lighting because while i tried to light this somewhat evenly it i didn't necessarily light it perfectly well so by blurring this out, we might be able to start seeing some differences in the the color. You can see darker areas and lighter areas depending on the way the light was hitting it. So as I blur that up a little bit, it's not perfect. So we're just gonna see if it looks good and we might use a small percentage of this to counter out the lighting. Not something I super worry about, but I wanna kind of fill this in even more. There might be other techniques for this, but I'm actually gonna just duplicate my layer, command or control J and then collapse my layer. Duplicate my layer, collapse my layer. And by duplicating it and then merging it, so it's Command or Control J, Command or Control E, and I'm just repeating. Essentially, I'm bringing, I'm blurring it, or I'm duplicating the blur and then re-overlaying it on top of itself. So we get this really solid mass of it. On you know, so it's blurring on the edges. Let's go ahead and pull back on the saturation all the way, so we end up with just a black and white image. And then we can go to our levels, and I'm going to kind of set. I'm going to erase out essentially everything that's not giving us any information. 
And if we want to, we could also throw in another quick blur. If I hold down alter option, I'll get the menu again, blur this a little bit, but not so much that we lose it, but it's gonna get rid of any pixelation we got from the levels. And now I invert the layer and now it's going to darken or lighten certain areas depending on the lighting. Now, the problem is, is we get these really extreme areas, primarily the beard and the beard is really dark because it, the beard was really light. Now, ultimately what I wanna do is set this to overlay and you see it actually is gonna even out the overall lighting quite a bit. But what I want to do is erase out the beard. So if we wanna be doing it non-destructively, we can create, of course, create a mask. I get B for brush, so we got the brush tool. Let's go ahead and start increasing our brush quite a bit. I'm on black, so as I paint in black, it's going to start masking out those areas. And as long as I'm in the middle here, and I don't get too near the edge, I don't have to be super accurate as long as it just kind of looks good to my eye. So I'm gonna erase out everything it's kind of doing to the beard. And honestly, I'm gonna remove a lot out from these flesh tones, just so that's, that stays a little bit more even. Let's go ahead and start scooting out to the edge a little bit. And as we get to the very back, once again, if I'm being careful, like if we really erase out just to the edge of this, and we do the same on the opposite side, then I think it could work all right. It's a little tricky here because this island is interfering with what I want to do there. So I'm going to do a wand selection here and I'm going to do a, I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to go to the lasso tool actually and hold down alt option, which is going to start erasing. I'm going to very carefully erase out that island. Oops. I should have been hitting plus because I inverted it. So we got to do that again. Here we go. I'm doing this with a mouse there. <laughs> okay, cool. So now I, that's on the edge. So now I should be able to Go back to my brush tool and erase this out. Oh, I have to invert my selection. Control, Shift, I. And now I can go and erase out this beard edge a little bit. I think I was decently careful there. And once again, we're just lightening that all up again. Shrink it a little bit. Let's get this tuft of hair a little bit lighter. Now, the basic idea is that this has all gotten rebrightened up, but everything else has the the lighting has gotten more even. Everything got a little bit brighter. The dark areas got lighter. The light areas got a little bit darker. Just flattens it out a little bit more. So now, when we introduce our own lighting inside of 3D, it should be a little bit more even. Now, this might end up being a little heavy-handed. So of course, we have control over our our opacity. So I can pull this to any level that I want. I do think it ends up getting a little bit bright. So I'm only going to introduce some of this. It's going to even out some of the lighting. But I'm actually pretty happy with that. I think that looks pretty good. But the only way to know for sure is to hit save and let's jump back into Cinema 4D and reload our material and we should see the overall look of the entire thing. Actually, Photoshop probably didn't save quite yet. Let me make sure it did. I think so. And I hit reload again there. And now Photoshop saved and you see the entire thing lightens up a little bit. Everything looks a little bit more even. And it doesn't look like we introduced any extra horrible seams down the back. Like it's all just what we had before. The beard is still nice and bright. Everything's a little bit more evenly lit. Pretty happy with that overall. I like the way this is looking. I'm trying to think if there's any other tricks I want to do. There's a little patchiness in the beard here that's jumping out at me. But really, for the most of it, I'm pretty happy with it. So let's jump into Photoshop, do the last couple of tweaks. Let's go ahead and, yeah, let's do a quick bit of patching here. So back to the healing brush tool, zoom up on this part of the beard. Here's that patchiness I didn't like the look of. Shrink up the healing brush, boom, 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 boom. Any place that's kind of jumping out. And I mean, we could spend, you could spend all day introducing, like cleaning things up, manually painting things. It would be a never ending process. And now stylistically, I think this is where I'm gonna end it. I'm even gonna save it right there. But stylistically, if you wanted to, you could do things like, I would probably duplicate this layer because I don't wanna lose it, but I could blur layers. I could go to our, let's see, go to our blur menu and we could do something like a uh, smart blur is actually deactivated there. Maybe smart blur doesn't work on 16 bit. But yeah, things like, you know, well, in, in that case, I, if I was just to do a Gaussian blur, like we could potentially blur these things out and you see everything gets a lot more even. And then we could erase out, if I hit E, we could potentially erase out our seams here. So those become a little bit more crisp if we wanted to. And you could kind of even things out. Stylistically, you could start running filters on it and kind of do whatever you want. I don't know what filters are available. But 
Yeah, I think that's pretty much going to wrap up what I want to do with this cleanup. And I think we are now ready to pass this back over to Aaron to jump into substance. That is saved. I'm going to go jump into Cinema 4D and let's save this as another new file. I'm just going to save it as, that's UV transfer. I'm going to just save it as uh, textured Photoshop. And that's the file that Aaron can pop open and continue working from. I just want to say, uh, in all the all of the photogrammetry stuff that I've done, this is where I stop. I don't go any further. Maybe I add a little bit of noise inside of Photoshop. I do some noise overlays inside of Cinema, but this is where I'd stop. So he's about to jump into Substance, and if you don't have Substance, then you could stop here or do other techniques inside of Photoshop to overlay some textures. But let's go ahead and just add on that extra little bit at the end and head it over to Aaron. Okay, let's go ahead and grab that file that Chris just sent over. And before we take this into Substance Painter, I want to show you guys a few quick uh, staging things that we could be doing to cleaning, to be cleaning this file up a little bit more. So the first thing let's do, let's just get rid of any of these unnecessary meshes at this point, because now all we need is this final lovely looking gnome mesh that we have. And I want to get rid of any of these unnecessary materials as well. Let's actually keep this one material that we have applied on, but I want to change the name from Matt to Gnome. And this is actually important because this is how our naming structure will be set in place when we import this mesh into Substance Painter. And from here, I like to export out FBX files for Substance, but you can also do an OBJ if you're not working with materials. Uh, let's say Gnome to Substance. And I want to make sure the textures and materials is enabled because we want to be embedding that material so that the name that we've placed here will actually carry through. Okay, let's go ahead and open Substance Painter now. And if, for those of you who don't know, Substance Painter is a really, really exciting tool. It's actually very similar to Photoshop, but for 3D models, essentially. In fact, uh, the maker of Substance, Algorithmic, which I actually have their website here, was just recently acquired from uh, Adobe. And so this is actually a very cool uh, uh, program. There's a bunch of actually tools in their, in their uh, library. And if we click on get substance here, I just wanna see really quickly. Uh, you can see it actually, it's a very, very uh, accessible subscription model. So I think it's $20 a month, I believe. There's a free 30 day trial. So feel free to pick this up if you guys are trying for the first time. Uh, but then, yeah, we're looking at about $20 a month uh, for access to their entire uh, program suite. Okay, so we jump back. Oh, and I also want to point out it is available for Windows and Mac. So now if we bring open Substance Painter, this is the, the starting page of Substance Painter. Again, with all of these tools, I won't dive too deep into the UI stuff, uh, but we will kind of discuss some of the features. So let's go into File, New. And the first thing I want to do is in this File tab here, let's go ahead and select that mesh that we just created. So if I navigate really quickly here to my folder, let's see here. Oops, it's inside. Here we go. We got gnome to substance. Let's go ahead and grab this and let's change the document resolution size from 1k to 2k. Now, one of the greatest things about substance is that most of the actions you're working in are procedural. So we can actually be changing this document resolution at any given point and all of the workflows that we'll be doing will automatically update. That said, I like to start off at 2k. Let's go ahead and hit okay. Now you can see we're actually bringing in the mesh right away. And so we can zoom in here. I can hold down shift and right click the mouse to dra and, and drag to actually rotate the environment uh, lighting in the scene. And the very first thing you have to do with Substance, again, there's a lot of UI stuff that we won't dive into today, but the very first step that you should do after you've imported a mesh and just double check to make sure that everything is coming in okay, yep, there's no weird topology issues. The first thing we wanna do is click on one of these toolbars here. Let's see which one it is. Yep, it's this one. It says texture set settings. Oh, and one of the first things I want to point out, actually, if we click on our texture set list, you can see that the, the set here is named gnome, and that's coming in from the material that we named earlier. So when we export our textures at the end here, they'll actually use this as their naming structure. Okay, so back to what I was saying. If we jump into the texture set settings here, here we could be targeting all of the different uh, maps and channels that we'll be painting on. So everything from base color, height, roughness, 
uh, whatever it may be. But the very first thing you should do after you've imported and, and confirmed that the mesh is working is we need to bake out our mesh maps. And that's important. You can see here the normal maps, world space, ID, ambient occlusion, so on and so forth. This is important because most of Substance Painter's smart generators and different functions that it has uh, rely on these maps here to uh, calculate what's happening. And so the first thing we need to do is actually provide Substance with these maps. And to do this, let's click this Bake Map Mesh Maps button. There's a few final things we have to do. So let's go ahead and uh, increase our output size. Again, I'll work in 2K for the time being. And we can actually disable the ID map because we don't want to worry about exporting out an ID channel. Uh, we're not going to be needing that for any, any sort of uh, purpose in this example. And the rest of it we can actually ignore. All I wanted to do is just set the resolution size for what we'll be baking. And let's go ahead and click Bake. And so now you'll see it takes a little while, but Substance is essentially baking out and calculating ambient occlusion, curvature, uh, world positioning. So it's figuring out, you know, which way, where the mesh is oriented, which way is the bottom uh, versus the top part of the mesh. Um, and now it's actually a very quick process in this case. So you can see here now we've got all of these maps that we successfully baked and we're ready to get rolling with this now. So the first thing I want to show you guys, currently we don't have a material being applied uh, or, or a texture to this, this gnome. Now, of course, you know, Substance ships with a bunch of default materials and, and stuff that we could be loading in. We could do something really weird here. Like I've got some pre-imported in that I think I've, I've had and downloaded from other uh, places, but you know, we could, we could make this Chrome if we wanted, but I really, Chrome Dome, I really liked all of the work that Chris just did uh, cleaning up that texture that we baked out from Meshroom. So let's go ahead and import that first before we do anything else. And I can do this uh, by hitting this button down here, which is the resources importer uh, manager. And so what I can do is actually click add resources. Let's navigate and find that uh, Photoshop document that Chris just had. Is it this one right here, Chris, or did you have a, a I different one? I think so, one? I just saved over the original. Oh, great, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and import this. And right now it says undefined. What we want to do is define what sort of um, properties this is. And so you, you can be loading in alpha maps, you can be loading in you know LUTs or different HDRI environments to be lighting the scene. But in this case, we know that this is going to be loaded in as a texture file. And in this case, I'll import this into the project. And let's click import. And now you'll see down here on my shelf, if I bring this up a little bit, it's taking a second, but here you can see is actually that PSD document being imported in. In fact, if I click on this project, we can isolate just, these are the only uh, maps be, that are relevant to the project we're working on right now. And so here is that Photoshop document. And let's go ahead and apply this to our mesh. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and delete both of these layers. And one of the things you'll notice is actually that Substance Painter uh, works pretty similarly to Photoshop. Um, and so what we can do here, we can add layers, we can add fill layers, uh, you can be you know, having folders as well as adding like masks if you wanna like add a clipping mask essentially to a layer. And the number one uh, important thing that I like to stress when you're working with Substance Painter is that you wanna be working with a non-destructive uh, workflow. And what I mean by that is so currently, if I take just this empty layer that I had and I take a brush tool, let's go ahead and change our color to something like red. And so if I'm painting on this empty layer, you can see here, I can actually paint on the actual 3D asset. And really what's happening here, if I change my viewport mode for a second, you can actually see, we can see both the 2D and the 3D viewport, similar to Rhizom when we were in earlier. And so you can see here in real time, I can actually go back and forth and do either or, and I'm actually painting onto this, onto this mesh, which is really cool. The problem though, is that I can't undo any of these changes very easily. I, of course I can undo, but it's hard for me to target maybe the specific stroke stroke that I did before and disable it. This is a very destructive workflow. And so what I like to do instead of painting directly onto a layer like this is actually take a fill layer instead. So here I've got the fill layer. Let's change the color to red. So you can see it's being applied to the entire thing right now. And rather than painting on this specific uh, layer where the red is, what I can do is actually throw this into a folder. Let's delete this. We'll try this uh, from scratch. I can actually throw this into a folder and mask, apply a black mask to this folder. And so what you have to think of is essentially we've, we've applied an alpha mask to this folder and because it's all black, in fact, I can actually go in here and I can actually target the mask channel. You can see because it's all black, we're not actually feeding any of that red through to the actual mesh. And so what we can do from here is go ahead and apply a paint layer 
And now you can see, because I'm actually working on this black mask, I don't have any colors anymore. I just, I'm working in grayscale values. So I can either be painting black or white values. And when I paint white values, we're actually painting back through our mask. See, we're actually painting our alpha mask essentially. And what this is doing is then in real time, feeding through everything, exposing the material that we have tucked underneath this folder. And so I can actually drag this red material out. And you can see if I were to go in and grab maybe a different material again, let's grab this, this brass. And we'll come back into the material. You can see now instead of the red, we're masking whatever is embedded inside of this folder, whether it's the brass, whether it's what's the red color. And the advantage to doing it this way is that this layer is still entirely procedural. So I can go in and I can change the color values to something like blue. I can target different channels. So, you know, here is height information. So I can actually, if I zoom in here and I lower my height, I, you can see we're actually adding either positive or negative values into like a displacement or a height map uh, that we could be loading into our wow. textures. Yeah, it's really cool. Everything from roughness, we could be targeting, we're isolating just, you know, very matte uh, roughness values just to whatever's being exposed through this mask. And I bring all of this up because it's really important, like I said, to be working non-destructively so that we can be flexible in how we're setting everything up. Okay, that said, let's get rid of all that. And very quickly here, let's jump into just 3D so I can just see this mesh. Let's go ahead and add a fill layer again. And if I hold down the Alt key and click, so here you can see are all the different channels that were enabled. So you can see with, with color enabled, we have this base color channel where anything that we do here is being applied. If I, dis, if I click on this, I'm actually disabling it. You can see it looks different now. And so we've actually removed, we're not accessing the color channel in any way. And so in this case, all I want to do is hold down alt and click on the color channel. And that's just isolating. So we're turning off all of these other channels just so that we only are focusing on the base color right now. And what I want to do instead of applying a color value here, what we can do is actually go into our projects tab again, grab this PSD that Chris had worked on and drag this in on top of the base color. It's gonna take a second to update, but now you can see because we're set to UV projection, just like you would be in cinema and the scaling is set to one, we're actually mapping that PSD document exactly onto our mesh. And so now essentially all we've done up until this point is just create a one-to-one -one environment matching what we had already inside of cinema. But the advantage now is that I wanna show you guys how I tend to use Substance Painter in this case as a pipeline tool to add extra details that, you know what, maybe weren't even on the original mesh that we were scanning, but really as a sort of control over my artistic direction and ideas that I have, maybe I wanna go in and actually paint very specific height information to break up some of these highlights, maybe more roughness values. We can be doing all of this more procedurally and non-destructively inside of Substance Painter. To do this, let's go ahead, and I'm gonna show you guys a few different things. So. What we can do, let's go ahead now, we'll keep this, let's rename this as our base. And now on top of this, let's go ahead and add another fill layer. And for an example, again, I'm gonna hold down Alt, just targeting the color channel. And what I can do is let's, you know, again, we'll apply red, just so that it's very easy to understand what's going on. We will throw this into another folder because remember we wanna work non-destructively here and we'll apply a black mask. And then I wanna apply a paint layer to this. And so remember, we're painting black and white values. I'm gonna grab the white and you can see we're doing this. But the other really cool thing here, because you remember we baked out all of these uh, maps at the beginning of our import phase, what I can do now is actually use some of uh, Substance Painter's native smart masks, which are really, really cool, essentially presets um, that come shipped entirely with Substance Painter for different effects. And so like, you know, let's see here, what do we want? Look at like, okay, cavity rust. So what, what we can derive from, from, the, from the name even is that we're gonna be targeting sort of like the, the cavities, the, the deep pockets of this mesh. And so what I can do, because this is a smart mask, is just drag this right onto our folder layer. And you'll see it comes in as a mask editor. And when I click on this layer, already you can see, it almost looks like we're targeting like the AO that we had baked out. But, the, but again, the really cool thing about Substance Painter is that all of this is procedural. And so I have all of these parameters on the right here where I could be targeting, you know, I could be lowering the balance. So we're effectively turning this down a little bit 
Let's actually change, because we're working non-destructively, we can actually come back into the embedded material here. Let's change this from red to something, maybe Maybe we want to add a little dirt. Maybe this is actually a dirty gnome. Maybe it's been outside in, in, uh, in the mulch. And we can, you know, set more of like a dirty color. Let's bring back the roughness channel by clicking on it. And we'll increase the roughness. So now we're breaking up some of these highlights by bringing in more roughness values. Let's jump back into our mask editor that we're working on, and we can continue to refine some of this. So there's this global contrast, and if I turn this down, you can see we're actually smoothing out some of these values. And one of the things I like to do to really help uh, see exactly what I'm doing here, you can change from the material to mask again, and you can see exactly what we're targeting. So you can see in real time, we're actually building our uh, alpha channel. I like smoothening this out quite a bit. Okay, let's jump back. Okay, maybe that's a little strong. And so what I can do actually from here on my master folder, so if I close everything, you can see I've got my folder. Here is the opacity level of this folder. And so if I tone this down, you know, I can be kind of like finessing this. Maybe I, I liked all those values we had before, but it's just simply a little too strong. So we can tone this down a little bit. Something like this, maybe it might be enough, you know? Um, so we're adding just a little bit of extra detail that wasn't even there before but I think it's helping to add a little bit to the realism. The next thing I want to do is add just a little bit of height data to this uh, because th you can see it, this very much feels like a smooth asset, uh, especially with the, the highlights. And so I'm going to repeat this whole thing again. I can just copy the folder this time though, and let's rename this to height so we can keep track of what we're doing. And we'll rename the old one dirt. And this time, let's get rid of all of those maps that we just built. And let's jump back in here to our embedded layer that we're working with inside of this height folder. Let's turn off both of these. And I just want to be targeting the height channel this time. We'll come back in. Let's add a generator this time. This time, instead of using these smart filters, we'll build our, our smart generators, we'll build our own. And so we can do this just by clicking on the generator, click here, and let's do mask editor. So we're going to build our own very quickly. And then this texture, I want to go ahead and you can see there's a lot of like procedural textures. Let's just type in noise and we'll see what we can get. Black and white spots. And let's see here. Oh, you know what? I'm doing this wrong. Sorry. We can just actually just feed it in. Uh, rather than a generator, we can actually just feed in a fill. My apologies. And we can just feed this in here. And so now what's happening, uh, because we actually haven't applied any values here, that's what's going on. So we need to change our height values. Right now they're set to zero. So we're not actually uh, adding or decreasing any height values. So as soon as I turn this down, now you can see what's happening. So we're using this black and white uh, map to actually feed in as our mask where that height information is coming. And so from here, I'm just going to tone this down just a little bit. And we'll do this by tweaking the opacity. And let's actually increase the scaling so that we can make these a little bit finer details. There we go. Now we can start to see. Obviously, this is a little too much, but now I'm getting some of that nice pop that we were missing before. This really feels like it has a nice grit to the, the surface. Tone this down just a little bit. Okay, and the last thing I want to do is let's add a little bit of dust. Maybe maybe there's some dust on top. So we've added dirt that's in these crevices, but I also want to add a little bit of dust where it's just focused on the top of the mesh. And to do this, let's create another folder, another fill layer. Just want the color and the roughness. We'll add a little bit of like a tannish color to this this time. And increase the roughness. And this time I want to add a black mask to the folder again add a generator this time, and let's do a mask editor. <laughs> I know there's a lot of stuff. No, um, I know, like the procedural nature. I didn't, I always thought substance designer was like the procedural one, but the way this is layering up generators and creating masks is not at all the way I thought the workflow on this tool went. 
Yeah, no, it's it's great. Uh, so Substance Designer, you can build a lot of like the tools, like these smart tools that I'm using. You can be using Substance Designer to like actually be building your own. Um, but yeah, there there is a lot of similarities in both both applications. Um, and so the last thing I want to do really quickly here, because of, again we baked out all of these maps from before. I just want to target this world space normal. And so when I start to uh, drag this in, you know what? Actually, I think it's the position gradient. Which one is it? Oh, let's tone this down. What are we doing wrong here? Okay, I just needed to tone it down a little bit. So you can start to see. So this is working. It was just set too strong. So by having the world space normal turned up all the way, what we're saying is only look for like the top surface areas that are seeing like the top of the the world and what we can do from here is just drag in the balance a little bit more and so you can see i'm building essentially like a a dust positioning you can, you can use this for snow you could use it for dust whatever it may be and then again i'm just going to tone this down just a little bit and of course you can continue adding your own effects and stuff but really what we've done is just adding a little bit of you know extra extra information here and the really cool thing i mentioned that everything that we've done so far has been procedural and the advantage to that if i jump into my texture set settings this whole time we've been working in 2k but the really cool thing is that i can go ahead and change this and upres it even this late stage in the game to 4k and everything all of these maps will be recomputed really quickly to 4k all of these uh, noises and everything and the generators will be recomputed in 4k and so we're actually able to get even more details being applied to this mesh than before and i can really show you what i mean if let's jump down low to like 1k and so you can see here we're actually able to very quickly determine our output resolution size and then the final thing here before i hand this back over to chris if you want to do any sort of final staging areas maybe back inside of cinema 40 is we need to export out these channels you know we've been working with base color height roughness all of these but we need to bring these out as bitmaps that we can load back into cinema 40 and your render engine of choice and i think in this case today we'll probably be using redshift so what we can do is actually go ahead and go to file export textures and one of the really cool things is that uh, Substance Painter actually ships with a lot of different presets for whatever render engine you might have. So if you're working in real-time interactive stuff, you have all these different Unity presets, Unreal, looks like there's V-Ray, Arnold, so on, so forth, Corona. Uh, and we can actually just go ahead and click Redshift. And so what this is going to do is take all of the information that we've been painting and automatically convert them into the types of maps that Redshift works with so that we can have a seamless integration, plugging that all back into side Cinema 40. I can set my, my output uh, file type here as well as my bitmaps. I want to work in 16. Let's go ahead and set an output. I'll make a new folder and name this texture exports. And we'll go ahead and select this and click export. Now you'll see our, um, Substance Painter is exporting out all of these different maps that Redshift will take, which we will then feed into Cinema 4D. Okay, here we are back on my machine, and all we have to do is import the materials from Substance Painter into Cinema 4D. So I'm gonna open up our most recent file, which is just the low poly gnome. This currently has the older material, but let's go ahead and copy in Aaron's new material. So let's jump up a level or two. Here's our new textured export. So I'm going to copy that entire folder. Let's go into our actual final one in here. I'm going to paste it into there. And let's go ahead and just rename the folder into the TEX, the text folder. And now we should be able to see all these with this file right now. Now, uh, we could render this in Cinema 4D, but hey, Maxon just acquired Redshift. So let's do some Redshift in here. We'll keep it real basic. So we don't need that material because we're going to make the brand new Redshift material. Boom, let's apply that immediately. Let's pop it open and take a look. We're going to be feeding in our materials to different channels. And to do that, we have to go into our shader graph. So let's go ahead and pop that open right here. Here's our Redshift material. I need to feed the, all the different textures in via the texture node. So let's go ahead and search for texture, drag that in. Here's our texture node. Let's immediately load in our different materials. So here we can see, let's make sure we're in the right folder. We are not. 
I'm glad I checked. Go in here and we can find our different material. So here's our diffuse material. Let's pop that open. And our diffuse material is real straightforward. Let's drag it into the Redshift node and feed it into the diffuse layer. So we'll just do diffuse color. Boom, that one's done. Let's go ahead and copy this node to save ourselves a, a split second. And let's go track down the next map. On this one, we're going to be importing, I think, the gloss layer. So the gloss layer is a little funky here. What we're going to do is actually drag that into our Redshift Material node. We're going to be dragging that into our Reflection Roughness. But gloss is kind of the inverse of roughness. And thank you, uh, Billy, for giving us a heads up on this. So it's kind of the opposite of what we want. We can fix it automatically by going into our Redshift Material, going from Basic to Advanced, and telling it to convert the glossiness to roughness. So that's actually going to invert the map, and that should now look correct. And we got one more node that we need. Let's go ahead and make one more copy and we're going to load in. We could use either the normal or the bump. We did a test and they both seem to be pretty much identical for our purposes. So to keep it simple, we're gonna load in the height map, which is the bump. It's the black and white image. And we need to convert that into something that the Redshift material can deal with. So let's go ahead and search for the word bump. And then we can pull in bump map and we feed this into the Redshift bump into the input and now it's determining how big the height is going to be and now we can just take that and feed it also into a redshift material into overall into our bump input and there we go that's some basic stuff set up let's go ahead and close both of those down let's set up a tiny quick environment in here let's just make a disk to be a floor we'll make another redshift material i'll even just leave that generic we'll apply that directly and let's go ahead and set up some sort of basic light. So we'll go redshift and we will add a redshift light. We'll add a dome light and we should feed in an HDR. I've already got one prepared. Load that right in. Give it a second to load and that should be pretty much ready to render. So let's go ahead and open up our redshift render view and we'll hit play. It's going to load the scene in. It's processing all the textures and the materials and boom, we are now loaded in. So if we go and we zoom up on our gnome, you see we're getting really awesome feedback immediately in the viewport. And immediately we should be able to see that we've got this nice little subtle bump, our kind of our 4K bump in here. And we've got different glossiness where the dust is. And we've actually got the dust layer applying overall to the entire shape. So that's all looking really good. Um, of course we can, uh, go into the different layers and tweak the amount that things are being blurred, go into the Redshift Material tab. We could change the amount of overall reflection that there is. We could change, uh, we could add subsurface scattering. We could shift hues around. There's so many additional things we could do. And if anybody's interested, we could do some follow-up tutorials about that type of stuff. But I think for the most part, that is where we are going to wrap this one up. Uh, we have brought our little guy, this tiny little gnome, from the real world into Cinema 4D, ready to render, ready to make a bunch of clones, ready to have a whole gnome party going. <laughs> Okay, so that actually wraps up Rocket Lasso's very first tutorial. And Woo! man, that was a doozy. That was a huge <laughs> tutorial. And I'm, I'm so excited to have done this tutorial with you. Not only was there a million cool techniques in there and fun things, but I, I just really love these combo tutorials where you have somebody to bounce ideas off of different techniques, like somebody who can fill in the gaps on one side and the other person is learning while we're recording it, even though we just did like a six hour marathon <laughs> to record this entire thing. Uh, so thank you so much, man. Oh, of course. No, thank you so much for uh, for thinking of me. I'm, I'm honored to have led you down this rabbit hole a little bit, but you definitely surpassed uh, most of the knowledge that I had gathered in my own process. So it's always fun and exciting and inspiring to see uh, where you took it and to be along for the ride. So Aaron, where can people find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram, both at Aaron Covret, A-A-R-O-N-C-O-V-R-E-T-T. -T. And there will be a link to that in the description below. And you want to be sure to follow him because he just does amazing, incredible work. I've seen some of the projects that he's currently working on and you're not going to want to miss those for sure. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. So if you enjoy this kind of content, be sure that you subscribe to this YouTube channel. We'll be doing more of this. We do a bunch of live streams every single week. I've got a lot more tutorials planned, like way too many tutorials planned. I've got a lot of guests lined up and we'll be seeing Aaron again for sure. So if you want to support Rocket Lasso, there's actually a Patreon set up. All this content is going to be free for everybody always, but if you want to help 
keep this going and make it so I'm available to do more live streams and answer questions for people and make more tutorials, head on over to Patreon. It's super appreciated, but not necessary at all. So thank everybody so much, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye, everybody.